Hey, and welcome back to the number one podcast in the world, Cellarcast, episode 80. Uh, maybe soon to be followed up by uh, episode 81. <clears throat> so I didn't really do an episode last week because I was, uh, I just didn't want to do any work. It was right when my birthday was happening, and I wanted to give myself a week off. So, uh, yeah, a week off. Um, the first week of January. So I just sort of uh, didn't really do anything of, of substance <laughs> for about a week. And uh, today is probably the last day that I'm on that, actually. Nope, it's the fir- technically the first day, because I'm recording this at like 2 a.m. <laughs> that I am going to be doing, start getting back to work. Uh, but I personally, I like to have... I don't like the idea of missing a week because in this weird way in my mind, I feel like these podcasts kind of like, uh, it's like a timeline. Does that make sense? Like I get to track like, oh, I've been doing the podcast for 80 weeks or well, 81 weeks now. Um, and I don't know, like, like missing a week. I don't know. I, I, I feel weird about not having that. It's like, like I like the consistency of doing the podcast every week and every week is is the next number and the next episode and it kind of helps me keep stuff in perspective a bit i guess it's really easy um when you're just kind of like doing stuff on your own and uh kind of keeping to yourself a lot like i do to just sort of lose track of days and and like when does this happen that happened on oh my god that happened when i was working on the i video uh oh god i remember like my brother came in one evening and he wanted me to basically help him out with his, like, an essay that he was writing. And I just kind of, like, gave him a little, yeah, you know, I, I worked with him, I gave him some advice and stuff like that. And then, later on, uh, he comes back to me. <laughs> Excuse me. And the final draft is due. And, uh... And he immediately, you know, he comes to my door, he's got his laptop. I know what it's about. And he goes, yeah, sorry, I know I bothered you about this, like, a few days ago. And I was like, what do you mean a few days ago? It's like, yeah, I, I bothered you about this. I asked you about this, like, three days ago or something. I was like, no, I, you talked to me about that yesterday. And he goes, no, that was three days ago. And I was like, wait, when did you? He goes, that was Monday. Now it's Thursday. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a while since the project really, like, totally consumed me like that video did. Jeez Louise. <laughs> uh, that's what happens when you're trying to put out a video, like, every two weeks. <laughs> and that's a big, as gigantic of a project as that one. Um... Yeah, didn't get that with the Senate hearing video, because I, I gave myself a lot more wiggle room on that, and I think it still came out. I, I got out what I wanted to get out with there, um, with that one. So, yeah, uh, it, it's really easy to just, like, really lose track of days and stuff like that, especially, oh god, especially recently my sleep schedule's been a total, total weird nightmare situation where I've just, it's, I've been, like, sleeping in these, like, four-hour increments or something like that, uh, and falling asleep early, and I just, I never feel really rested, and I don't know, it's like, I need, I, I'm so vulnerable to, to falling into something like that if I don't have some sort of work to structure my, structure my life around, some kind of schedule, or, or, or at least, like, a goal to, to create a bit of, like, a schedule, uh, and like, yeah, and it, I have I have realized in the last like year or two how like bad sleep is the biggest killer, dude. It is, it will wreck you. Like it completely. You, I feel so bad when I when I have bad sleep. Like I'm not sleeping long enough, or like I'm staying up too late, or yeah, I'm doing I'm just doing something to mess it up. I feel terrible. Like, I'll feel bad for, like, it only takes, like, one night, and I'll feel bad for, like, three days while I'm trying to get it back, back on track. Uh, It's, it's a real, yeah, and, and, and obviously, like, 
trying to do work with that, especially any kind of like significant, like large project or something. It's like, dude, my energy levels are just messed up. Everything is, is just, it's messy. And, and I like the consistency of having a schedule. Like I feel good when I'm on some kind of a schedule. And uh, when I give myself a week to just, I'm not going to do anything. I just, I don't know, I end up feeling it's cool. And then I'm like, eh, I need to, I need to get back to work. Like I, I have, I need to be doing something to some extent. Uh, and that's why I feel like I haven't really done much productive stuff. Like, I feel like I've just slept and watched a lot of YouTube last, last week. Um, didn't even play that many. Ga- I, I, I played a couple games and, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, later on, but, uh, cause I like to save that stuff for the end for some reason. Uh, da, 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 da. yeah, it's, it's been a nice break. I might, I might end up recording just like a weird little bonus mini episode to be like episode 81 or something like that, just so that I can have that, um, and, and keep, keep the numbering proper. <laughs> uh, yeah, so maybe be on the lookout for that, I suppose. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, I pretty much just had a pretty chilled out week. Uh, not really thinking about work. I, I, I do have a pretty basic idea of, of the next two or maybe three videos that I want to get done. Uh, and I think that they're going to be pretty interesting and, and something kind of different from what I've usually, usually done. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I guess it would be nice to kind of make this like a, like a 2020, maybe that'll be the bonus episode, the 2022 recap. Yeah, like a, a just a little, a little recap episode uh, for, for the whole year. Yeah, let's do that. All right, so be, be on the lookout for that, probably like right after I record this <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, um, I want to talk about, I guess the first thing that I sort of did this year. Actually, t- actually, it was built on New Year's Eve, but it was uh, my stream I did. The stream I did on New Year's Eve, me and Prox hung out, or is it hanged out? Mm-hmm. And I put together my brand new hitbox or leverless controller. It's not—it's not a brand name hitbox. It's an—it's an, it's an uh, all fight sticks hitbox. So uh, if you're not familiar, uh, <laughs> A hitbox is essentially like a, a specialized controller for fighting games. Kind of think of, imagine like an arcade stick controller that you'll see people use, except a hitbox, which is uh, the, the sort of like the term that's sort of emerging is either like a stickless or a leverless or sometimes an all button controller. And it's kind of what it sounds like. It's, it's basically the same idea as a fight stick, except instead of uh, uh, a joystick an arcade stick for movement controls uh, you have a, a set of four buttons similar to a wasda but not not like a wasd layout for like technical reasons and stuff i think i've gone into a little more detail like that on the podcast before if i haven't just just ask me <laughs> um and i'll talk about it next time so uh uh wait oh lost my train of thought yeah so i put it together and for those of you who showed up to the stream thank you very much uh i it, i was expecting that it would all i sort of from the when i ordered it i kind of figured that it would come in just from the way that it was described on the website that it would come in all assembled and then i opened up the box and then it turns out that it was not <laughs> and it's just a bunch of separate parts that you had to put it together and honestly, it was really fun to to go through the process of figuring out how to construct it. Uh, it's one of those things like um, like with my PC, where it took <laughs> my PC. I basically spent like the whole day building it when I built it. If I was to do it again, it'd probably take me maybe an hour or two. Might be might be being generous there, but uh significantly shorter and that's because the first time i do it i really want to make sure i know what i'm doing i want to make sure that i'm not messing anything up and i'm like double triple quadruple checking every step of the process to make sure that i'm doing it properly so uh with the hitbox it did take us around three and a half little under four hours which is was basically actually ended up working out just fine because it was our 
and it was a, basically a four-hour countdown to uh, New Year's, New Year's Day, to midnight. My time, at least. And uh, uh, th- 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 I've been, can you tell that my sleep is weird because my brain is struggling to start up? <laughs> um, so it's funny because it's one of those things, a lot like building a PC, it seemed super uh, and overwhelming at first. And then kind of once I figured a couple things out, I was like, oh, this is actually quite easy. This is pretty simple. Uh, I could probably do this really fast if... Um, I just had like a, a quick guide to let me know which wires go to what buttons and stuff like that. But yeah, um, once we basically figured out, okay, so this connector goes into this part of the PCB, and then this is the orient. This is basically, basically, yeah, it's it's not a particular. I could explain it right now. It's just it's a box, the enclosure. You got buttons. You slot the buttons in from the top. Actually, pre- they 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 fit in very very snug. It's a neat little little mechanism. Uh, the way that they fit in there. Uh, they got these little, like, what would you call them? Uh, almost like these, these sloped sort of claws that point outwards on the buttons. And then as you as you press them into the top, uh, the, they, they kind of, like, close in. And then as soon as they hit, like, the end of the, end of the slope, like the, the bottom part of the ramp, the upside-down ramp, let's say, uh, they, like, snap back outwards into place. I don't know if that was a great descriptor of it, but yeah, it was. It was like, oh, it's a, it's, it's pr- it snaps in quite tightly, and then uh, you got a little PCB, which is the the uh, specifically the one that I have that you'll find in most people's is the Brooks Universal, like the fight board is I think what they what they end up calling it, uh, but it's basically just hey, if it has a USB port, it is compatible with this. <laughs> So then you just you screw that in to the inside, uh, and then you take a little. You get a bunch of wire, bunch of fucking wires, and then uh, there's a little, there's a big old twenty pin connector that you pull, that you slot into the PCB that has most of the wire buttons, like most of the wires to the buttons. And then you just do uh, all the buttons on the underside have one two two different hooks. One is for a grounded wire, which is the black ones, which uh, thankfully Prox is a uh, Prox is a, what is, uh, it's a degree in computer engineering, so he's he's familiar somewhat with <laughs> basic electronics and stuff like that. Uh, and he was uh, kind enough to <laughs> to tell me how that the black wires are usually for grounding, like uh, right after I figured it out myself because he was on his phone playing gotcha games. <laughs> <laughs> shout out prox uh so we then we just kind of uh, yeah honestly the process which was really nice what i appreciated was that the cable ties so the, the cables the bundles of wires uh on the connector they were nice enough to use cable ties to group the cables together by like the top row buttons the bottom row uh the movement buttons and like the menuing buttons. Those are all grouped together with cable ties. And they are also individually ordered uh, within those groups by length. So I think was the higher the button, the longer the cable or the shorter the cable, something like that. So, you know, the f- punch one is like the top row on the, on the furthest to the center. Punch four is top row furthest outward. And it's, it's ordered by that by length. And uh, once you kind of figure that out, it, w- it was actually pretty pretty simple to just go in and just slot them in with these. Uh, they got these little, like, rubber condoms on, these little weird little sleeve things on. And that sort of helped them stay in place, I guess. I guess they're, like, non-conductive. I don't know. Maybe they are conductive. I have no clue. Uh, and then, yeah, I did. I just kind of sealed it up. And I was pleasantly surprised that I did not close it up, like I didn't put the bottom back on after everything was hooked up, because I was expecting, much like with a lot of electronic stuff that you kind of DIY, I was expecting it to not work when I uh, tested it out, but I pulled up, uh, I think, plus R. Immediately, everything worked. (laughs) Every single button. I didn't have to fix anything. I didn't have to make sure something was, like, plugged in more. Uh, Just worked. 
So I, I closed it all back up, and I've been using it for the past couple days to uh, just try out a couple different games. Uh, try out with a couple different games. And it, it's it been nice. I've enjoyed the experience quite a bit. Uh, the, the one gripe I have, which is not so much a gripe as it is just a part of the learning process, which is that uh, on a keyboard, I'm very used to the uh, closeness of my fingers being like a certain distance away from each other, because obviously a keyboard is, you know, the keys are not very far apart. <laughs> uh, on this, if you just look up a picture of, of just do look like, you know, hitbox control, if you just search that up, if you're not familiar, uh, the keys are, uh, well, the buttons are uh, quite a bit further from each other and they're all a lo lot larger. They're about 24 millimeter buttons on mine in particular, which is kind of like a standard one. There's either 24 and a 30 millimeter. Uh, wide. I, I have the 24. Most out of like uh, classic arcades and going end up going with like a uh, 30 millimeter. I like 24 because I, I would rather just I like I prefer my fingers to be a little bit closer than that. Uh, that's what I'm more used to. It's it's closer to something that I'm used to, uh, but there is still like a, a bit of a, a learning curve with okay having to spread my fingers out, get kind of kind of used to the way that it feels. It it would be kind of like switching over to a new keyboard, I guess. Uh, like I used to use a membrane keyboard for forever when I was playing fighting games on a, on like my laptop, and then once I got this new computer, I have this. Uh, clickety clackety mechanical keyboard, which I greatly enjoy the feel of. Just a, a lot more. I just like it for stuff. I like the feedback that I get from the mechanical uh, uh, key. I think they're just red switches, if you're curious. Like, they don't have a super sharp, like, click in. But they've got that kind of, like... You can hear that. And I like the I like the feedback that I get. The way that it, like, kind of pops a little back up. I like the, the kind of chunkiness that it feels like that the keys have. I like the sound. It uh, it just make it feels good. <laughs> it feels good. Uh, and then I use my brother. He has some like Apple laptop, like a Mac book. I don't know what they are. I don't know what they're called. Wow, worst feeling keyboards I have ever touched. Holy cannoli! At least from my perspective. Jesus. Wow. <laughs> um. Do not like that. I could never use one of them. Jesus Christ. Uh, I much prefer. I much prefer this. Uh, and uh, well, actually, speaking of the feedback, that's one of the uh, to get to the pros of using it. I really enjoy using using it. I enjoy using the new leverless controller. The the clickety and the clackety is just fantastic. I can let me let me just like grab it. Oh, it's a heavy. It's a heavy thing. I got like a full on metal enclosure because I wanted something sturdy. I've got it in my lap right now. And just like the... Like, it's nice. Like, when you're doing stuff, when you're doing combos with this, it feels nice. And it's like, man, feedback... I harp on feedback a lot when I talk about games and stuff. Like, what does it sound like? What does it look like? What are the little touches in the animations and stuff? And that's because uh, I think it's really important. I think it's a huge part of, of how nice something feels is what feedback you get when you interact with it. And uh, this is really nice for that. I quite, I quite like it. Do I notice any performance upgrades? No. I mean, the truth is that a lot of people, a lot of people default to like, oh, to get good at fighting games, I need to get oh, like a, I need to get an arcade stick. I need to, I have to switch to like a, a serious controller or something like that. When in reality, unless the thing that you're using is literally like it doesn't work, like it's broken, uh, no, uh, switching to a different controller is not necessarily going to make you better. Uh, there's probably, to be on, a lot of people, like, default to, uh, physical, like, hardware upgrades, because, like that, because, or maybe not, an upgrade is probably the wrong word to use, but a, a switch in hardware, because it's sort of, like, a very, like, in our minds, it's, like, a very, um, concrete change, like, as opposed to the very, like, a lot of, like, vague, more sort of, like, uh, esoteric ways to improve, like, you know, hey, improving at these parts of the game 
or something like that. Uh, it, it's a very physical, like you can literally hold it in your hands <laughs> and use it. Uh, but as to whether or not it gives you an advantage, it's like, nah, eh. Um, it, it honestly comes down more so to comfort. Like some people are just going to feel more comfortable on a on a gamepad, like you know, PS4 controller or something like that. I mean, what's funny is that I feel very comfortable using like a controller, like a, a gamepad, if I'm just playing a console game. Like that's not an issue for me. But as soon as I play a fighting game, it feels weird. Which is, it's really funny. Like, as soon as I play a fighting game, it feels stiff and strange, and it's it's very foreign. Uh, but, but for any other, like, genre? Like, no. For some, I, I don't know why that is. Uh, I have to be using, like, my fingers as opposed to, like, my thumbs to be doing inputs and stuff. It's That's just a, a thing with me. I'm much more comfortable doing that. And I, I guess it has something to do with the fact that I learned the genre on keyboard, uh, it's going to vary. Like, some people just switch to stick because they think it's better. Well, not because they think it's better, but because they're, they, they're more comfortable on it. They like the feeling. They like how you kind of control it. Uh, uh, yeah, it just it's more comfortable. I was a, a trumpet player for a very long time. For I played it from, like, the seventh grade. Sorry, um, like, the fourth grade up to about uh, when I graduated high school. So about seven years, seven, eight years or so. And one interesting thing about trumpets is that when you do, that's that's actually a part where like switching to a better trumpet can literally make you sound better. It has nothing to do with that, but I guess just this is a funny thing it reminded me of. Switching to a different trumpet can literally make you sound better. So when you see like a, a, a golden colored trumpet, uh, that is that's like a uh, what's considered a student model for the most part. Um, there will be golden colored ones that are like not, but a silver trumpet is 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 generally either an intermediate or a professional one. So I was using a, a student trumpet for a very long time until high school, where I switched over to I upgraded to a professional trumpet. I got the uh, oh it's a Yamaha. Ooh, maybe I could find it's over. It's back there. I just don't want to like walk over and get it out hang on uh trumpet yamaha oh yeah it's a, a yeeter <laughs> a yeeter a ytr i think it was the 2330 i think it was the 2330 trumpets are very interesting as like a uh is this is the right one it's definitely a yeeter um uh trumpets are very interesting because they feel different and it's really hard to describe to someone how it feels different but i remember going to the store uh this music store and uh specifically they specialized in brass instruments and trying out a couple different trumpets and it was just fascinating how different they can feel like even ones in the same price point and i think the one i ended up going with was one of the cheaper ones but it just it felt a lot better to me and I the other guy who was kind of like showing us and he was you know he was sort of being our um, he was helping us out in the store essentially the representative uh, also played the trumpet and he I was like trying to describe him like this one it feels like a little snappier and this one feels like a little a little smoother I'm like does that make sense he's like no but I get it <laughs> like he didn't know exactly what I was feeling but he understood the experience of going from one trumpet to another and it just feels different in these weird subtle ways of that that are, are hard to describe um uh, I, uh yeah and that just ended up being the one that i i liked i liked the most i remember i had uh when i was in middle school i was renting i took the music lessons uh for a very for, for quite a few years, I want to say like three years, like when I was in middle, yeah, I think the whole time I was in middle school, I took music lessons at uh, this place. Oh, please tell me they're still open. Please tell me they're still open. Uh, oh, God damn it, I misspelled. Oh my God, I misspelled again. Okay. <gasps> oh, there's it. Oh. Yeah, hey, they're still open. Cool. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I took music lessons. Hey, if you're if you're in Chicago, 
Uh, I took music lessons at Flats and Sharp Music Co. on uh, on Sheridan. That's great. I'm glad they're still open. Uh, they were great. They were wonderful for me. I had a I had a great trumpet teacher. I had a couple diff I had a couple great ones. Um, because uh, my main the main guy who I learned trumpet from, or yeah, who's like my my tutor teacher or whatever, was this guy named uh, Roy McGrath. He's a, a wonderful saxophone player, and uh, he would have to like go on tour sometimes because he was in like a, a, a quartet. It was, I believe the Roy McGrath quartet. And he would go to like fucking like Mexico and China to play jazz. <laughs> and so he would just be gone for like three months. And I just had to have a, have a new person that I'd be working with. And they were actually all, they were all great. Um, they're all really nice. And I liked them a lot. Uh, wonderful, great people. At, over there. If you're in Chicago and you want music lessons, I would recommend Flats and Sharp. Uh, I'd love if I go back. I'd love to go visit there again. Uh, I, I did. I played at like concerts there. Anyway, um, the fuck was I talking about? Oh yeah. So I was I was basically like renting to own. Like we were basically paying off a trumpet from them, and uh, and then um, uh, and then. The one I was using, it had, yeah, the third valve would stick. The third valve would get stuck. And I couldn't figure out what it was. Like, I would oil it properly. I took care of it. I, I, I generally took care of my instrument, and I, I I made sure that it would get washed and things like that. And for some reason, the third valve would just stick. And there were no... Uh, it would stick, and then it would, like, slowly come up, which really fucks you up, right? When you're just trying to play, especially anything... You gotta make a quick movement. Uh, so we could, and there were no noticeable like physical imperfections in it. Like there wasn't a big dent in it or something. And and it was a problem that just sort of appeared one day. Um, that I hadn't had before. So I, they basically <laughs> very nice because they liked me a lot. Uh, allowed me to basically send it in for repairs, and I think that that they didn't charge me for that. And so this was thing was in the shop for like a month or two uh, when they finally got it back to me. And in that time, I was using this piece of shit that they just had lying around that was the only one they could get me. Um, and I remember fucking, they were like, oh, this is the only one we have. We're really sorry. <laughs> and I was like, and I just saw you look at this thing. You're like, this is a, this is a fucking jalopy of a trumpet, dude. <laughs> this is a, <laughs> this is a, this is a lemon. <laughs> it was like this old, practically rusting, like it had this, looked almost green, <laughs> just piece of shit trumpet. And you play on it for one second. I'm like, oh no. Like it's hard. It was hard to sound good. It was hard, literally hard to make notes sound good. It was harder to make sound in general on it. Uh, yeah, and then I fucking sent that thing, that trumpet in for, like, two, for, like, because it came back, same problem. We sent it back in, same thing, they didn't charge me, thank you. Um, can't, comes back, same problem, and eventually we just had to give me a new trumpet. <laughs> they just basically, re we just replaced it, because it was like, what, what is this thing's problem? I think I ended up going through, like, six different trumpets, uh... A lot of those were due to uh, them being stolen out of the trunk of our car, because uh, Chicago moment. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, brass is like an interesting... Maybe this is like dumb. Maybe there's like other... Maybe it's just because I don't have experience with other instruments, because I only ever played the trumpet. Uh, but one interesting thing about the trumpet, and, and I think brass in general is that um, it's it's a br I'll say that I'll at least talk on the trumpet because that's the one I have experience with is that two people can play the same note on the same trumpet and just in isolation like you don't not, not don't have to worry about being really in tune or anything two people can play the same note on the same trumpet and one person can play it so good that that you cry and the other person can play it so bad that you cry and it's this really and no one really like knows why it's this sort of weird mystical thing that like sometimes somebody just 
uh, we usually just call it your tone, which is just this vague, um, again, to use the word again, esoteric, uh, uh, yeah, mystical is how I would describe it, sort of quality that's sort of like a mix of, you know, your air pressure and, and, and maybe like uh, some other things, but, you know, your, your, the warmth, excuse me, the warmth of your breath and maybe the temperature that you're in, uh, maybe the location that you're in. I don't know, but there's just this thing where like, sometimes you just hear someone play one note. Here's a good example. I think I was a sophomore. No, I was a freshman. I was a freshman. And there was this guy in our jazz band who uh, was just, he was a senior. He was the top dog. He was the best trumpet player. He was like the, one of the, he was like the star of the band. Um, and he, on to, to boot, he was like a great guy. He was like a super high achiever, got great grades, uh, did like water polo and shit. No, he did rowing. He did crew. Uh, just, uh, he was really nice. He was a really, really nice guy. Um, great, great dude. Like very, like look up to him kind of thing. And, uh, I remember we went to, so we'd go to like a jazz concert that would have like a, a lot of other. A lot of other bands there performing. And then when you're not performing or after your performance, you basically just go into the audience and just watch the other schools perform. And we're just sitting there. And mind you, this guy is like the best trumpet player like in our band that I've like heard, right? And we're just watching other high schoolers play. And the school gets up and it's their second trumpet, the se second chair trumpet, which is usually the solo position. And they get to this point in the song and... He plays this one note. He plays one note. And fucking the the presence that he had in like one second, just from one tone, just, oh, I feel like I want to cry thinking about it right now. Like I'm getting, like I could feel it welling up. Just, and I remember looking at this guy, this senior, and... And all the trumpet players, we all look at him, and he just slowly turns his head to us, and his fucking jaw is down, and he's just, holy fuck. <laughs> and it wasn't even, like, a trumpet player thing. Like, everyone, we were talking to our director afterwards about that, and, like, everyone in the band just knew, holy shit, that guy. Oh... And I, you can't even put, like, a super hard thing on, like, well, where does that come from? What is specifically the thing? It's just he he, he had the sound. He had the tone. Uh, it, it, it just creates these moments. That's why, I, I don't know, live music is really interesting like that. Sometimes someone just plays a note. Like, in a recording, it's one thing, but you hear, like, you're there in person. You're like, oh, whoa. <laughs> It's crazy. I remember our director said, yeah, that's the type of performance. I loved how he said this. He said, it's the type of performance that makes you either want to give up or get better. <laughs> it puts you so hard into perspective. <laughs> it, it, it puts, it gives you such a hard perspective of how good you are in relation to someone else. It's like, fuck. <laughs> wow. I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget that moment. I had a moment like that, kind of with like YouTube. Oh, fucking, uh, what's this guy's name? What's this guy's name? Um, if you want to watch a great video, um, I it's called uh, this guy named Pat Finnerty. Oh, someone's walking outside. It's this guy called Pat Finnerty on YouTube, and he does a a a series called what makes this song stink and it's kind of a take on another music guy on youtube his name is uh, rick beato who does a series called why this like why this song's great or something like that and but pat does why this song what makes this song stink and the first like th what is it three episodes yeah the first like three episodes are just kind of like you know it's <clears throat> it's sort of what you would expect from a video like that. It's like him sitting in front of the camera, and he's a musician guy, and he's talking about why he doesn't like a certain song, and, and he's breaking it down and on like a musical level. And then you get to episode four, and it's Hey Soul Sister by Train. 
garbage song. Garbage band. And this video, I just put this on. It's like, you know, 45 minutes. I put this on to kind of like fall asleep watching because I thought it was just going to be a it's gonna be him talking about, you know, why he doesn't like a song. It'll be kind of like nice little little stuff to just help me go to sleep a little bit, kind of relax my brain. And it is it it starts out. It doesn't even start out like that. It it turns. It's I don't even know how to describe it. It's like not even. It it turns okay. It starts out with him like sitting down and like the first five, the first like seven minutes of this video aren't even him uh, like talking about the song. I think it's specifically the joke is that he doesn't even want to talk about it. So uh, he like, he's just talking about like anything else. He sits down, he makes like a little mobile of like, <laughs> like uh, uh, guitar pedals that's just kind of rotating over his head and he like makes like a camera that goes up like in uh that he like sets behind him and it's just he's just bullshitting around but like his tone and the way that it's edited and cut together and the different camera angles he uses it's very like it's very uh uh low it's not very flashy but it's very engaging and the way that things are paced the way that he talks uh the way that his, his his lines are cut together and uh, and and then it just it, he starts talking about the song and I, like the first segment on the song is like how much like how boring and, and bland the ukulele is and to do he, and then it just suddenly cuts to him and he's like in front of like he's he set up like two chairs in front of a gas station and he's giving free ukulele lessons and he just takes in this random like old guy and he just like hey you want to learn how to play the ukulele and he teaches him how to play the ukulele riff from Hey Soul Sister in like ten minutes. And, and then it's, like, him with, like, this girl, and, and he's like, hey, this is Sarah. She works at the, at, at the local mini golf course. And then he just, like, teaches her how to do, how to play the riff. And, and he's like, hey, how are they treating you at the, the mini golf course? And they just have this, like, conversation. And then it cuts back, and then he's talking to, like, this indie band he knows, because he lives in, like, Portland. He talks to this indie band he knows, and he, like, convinces them to do a cover of this, like, funk song from, like, the 70s. And then, like, it all ends up in, like, he, he's... He starts putting up posters around Portland for, like, a demonstration, like a protest against his soul sister. And and then he's, like, just hanging out in this public park with, like, a van. And he puts up a banner that says, like, it's called, like, the Stop the Train protest. And, like, people start showing up. And it just turns into this fucking crazy thing. It turns into this crazy production and I'm wa and it just happens and it's so natural and funny and entertaining and I'm watching this and I just feel like shit because I'm like fuck my videos aren't anywhere near as good as this I feel like I don't have a single video that's as good as this and I've made like 50 and this was like this guy's fourth video what the fuck what is wrong with me <laughs> what what <sighs> Ah, like I felt so like nothing against him. Like, if if it sounds like I'm saying anything against him, it's not at all. It's just like fuck. My God, I wish I was that good. I wish I made something this cool. Oh man. Ah. Oh. <laughs> ah oh, man. Like it makes me feel insecure, which I don't usually feel about my my videos, but that did. Holy crap! Go watch that video. Really incredible. Pat Finnerty. What makes this song stink? Uh, hey, soul sister. Wow, like, just, oh my god, like, another level. Like, there's so little like it on on YouTube. Ah, oh, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, it uh, either makes you want to get better or quit. And I was caught in between. I'm like, do I just throw in the towel? <laughs> I won't, don't worry. I'm too deep in. <laughs> too deep into this now. Um... Yeah, I don't know. Just that just blew me away. I had like a thing that I, I was I was thinking about, and then I totally, I totally like lost it. I totally forgot what I was gonna talk about. I whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, feelings of of whatever of of not being as as good. I don't know. Uh, God, what did I? Was I gonna talk about anything else related to this? How did I even get on this topic? I was talking about the hitbox, and then I started talking about the trumpet, and then that video. 
Yeah, okay. Well, hey. Hey, here's something that I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> uh, so I went over to Kat's a few days ago, and she had me watch all of Wednesday with her. She'd already seen it, and she was basically have uh, re-watching it with me. I was watching it for the first time. She showed me the first episode, <laughs> excuse me, like two weeks ago or something. It was still always fresh enough in my mind that I remember what was going on. Um, and then we watched episodes two through eight, all in all in one run. Uh, and to, to uh, preempt this, this is going to be a full spoiler review, because I had a lot to say about this show. And I had a lot to work out on what I thought about it, because it, it made me think a lot of things. It had me do a big thunk. Uh, so... I might forget a thing here or there because when you watch like a bunch of when you watch like a, a kind of dense show all in a row like it's a mystery show it's there's kind of like a lot of little threads and and red herrings and things like that so I might just I might like slightly jumble things up but I think I have a pretty good memory of basically what happens um, and a lot of this stuff was stuff that I made notes <laughs> that I, I wrote down. Um, at like the day or the evening that I was that I like got back from her place, and I was still thinking about it, and like why I had problems with it. I'm gonna spoil. Uh, here's the broad. Here's the 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 general summary of my thoughts on Wednesday. Um, uh, it is a decently paced show with a couple good performances. Uh, that is mainly brought down by a lot of very weak contrived writing and a very shallow uninteresting main character yeah that's actually a great way to sum it up uh that's kind of my main issues with the show uh it is pretty all right i don't like giving number ratings if i had to i guess i would give it a six that's it you can go watch it yourself anyway i'm gonna go into the into my entire discussion about wednesday <clears throat> all these thoughts that i've had i wrote a lot Okay, so basically, so Wednesday, it's the new Netflix show, um, uh, is about Wednesday Adams from the Adid, from the Adidams family, and, uh, she is going to a magical Harry Potter school, and she's solving a mystery, and she's a teenager now, she's aged up, um, it's kind of like a CW show, that's what I heard it compared a lot to, I haven't seen CW shows, but maybe that's a very apt comparison for those of you who have. Uh, okay, so the premise of this show is that Wednesday it gets, like, she, her, uh, Pugsley is getting bullied. This is how the show opens. Pugsley is getting bullied by these, like, uh, jocks at their, like, normal people school. They use the word normie unironically to describe normal people, quote unquote, like non non weirdos. And it's really painful and like it physically like it made me like deeply cringe. Gave me a deep, deep cringe. Uh every time they said it, and you say it at like multiple point multiple times, like almost every episode. It's very difficult to get over. Um, so the, the normie jocks, <laughs> it makes them sound all like 4chaners, uh, are bullying Pugsley. And so Wednesday, uh, they do like whatever, they do like water polo or something. So Wednesday releases fucking piranhas into the pool to kill them and one of them dies? I'm pretty sure he dies. It's, it's not super, like maybe I just missed it. Maybe he did survive, but that's like premeditated murder at the very least. Um, so she gets sent off to this boarding school for uh, the term that they use is outcasts, which is uh, funky supernatural peoples. I don't really know what makes Wednesday Adams like a supernatural. She's just like a girl. Uh, but f fine, whatever. Okay, it, it feels a little odd. I feel like in the original Adams family, these people just kind of existed. <laughs> they were just they were just quirky. Uh, maybe maybe that is it's all the all the quirksters go to this school, uh, and uh, there's like 
a murder as she starts solving. Here's my number. Here's my first issue. Um, Wednesday has no motivation in this show. It's really weird. Um, there's a basically the entire show hinges on her. The main thrust is that she is attempting to solve the mystery of these murders that are being committed by a, a mysterious monster. And where did it come from? Uh, who is connected to it? Why is this happening? Um, the problem is that she really has no reason to at all. So her initial motivation is that she wants to get out of the school. She wants to escape because she doesn't like being there for some reason. Uh, I think she's really she's just kind of a misanthrope. She just doesn't like like I would I would imagine that like oh she doesn't like being around normies. Uh, and so, oh, her going to a school for people like her would be great. Uh, maybe she would like that. Maybe she could, like, get along with people. But then she just doesn't. And she's, like, a gigantic asshole to literally everyone she meets for no reason. Like, no real reason. It's really strange. Like, people show her nothing but, like, genuine kindness and friendliness and are by all accounts good people, and she just dismisses them and is incredibly condescending and shitty for no real reason. So really, she's just a misanthrope, and she doesn't like people in general. Uh, which is like, there's like problems related to that that I have, but I'll say that for later. So... Her initial goal is she just wants to escape the school. So she works out this whole thing where she tries to escape and ends up witnessing um, a student getting murdered by the monster. Uh, and then suddenly uh, that kid shows up and he's just all fine and dandy the next day. So she then tries to, she's like, oh, am I, am I crazy? Am I, what's happening? So she goes to, tries to see what happened. She, she investigates what happened, what, what, why that, why, you know, he got killed. Why is he alive still? Because he, like, immediately, like, leaves or whatever. He leaves the school. He gets taken home. She's like, he fucking got, like, ripped in half. How is he alive? And it ends up that it turns out that the, the version of him that left was not actually him. It was her principal who can, like, shapeshift into people. And she did that to, uh, to, uh, uh, protect the school's reputation, I guess? I guess? Uh, people were already, like, dying in the proximity of the school, but fine, okay, fine. She didn't want, like, a student to die and not to be, like, reported on and stuff. Uh, so that... Th so then, for some reason, now Wednesday completely forgets about her goal of leaving the school and, st and just starts trying to solve the mystery of the monster and she just kind of starts doing this with no explanation and it, it's really odd i don't know what her motives are or like what is driving her to solve this mystery like she doesn't care about the school she doesn't care about the people there, especially not at the start of the show. Uh, she just... Like, it's super strange, because she keeps making really just consistent deadpan comments about how she wants... Would rather people just died. The show literally opens with her attempting to murder some people. Uh, but for some reason, she cares about the murders wouldn't she just i almost feel like it would be more in character for her to like want to kill more people <laughs> why does she care and that kind of like the root of the issue um that i have with her character is that she really has nothing going on but when i try to like look at her throughout the series and think about her like okay why is she doing things what does that say about her you really just end up with, like, nothing, and the show never really delves into any of her internal logic or her reasoning or her values or anything. And it's really strange because, like, the elements are there 
to have done that. Like, the first thing she does is, like, yeah, murder. But that was because uh, uh, she was trying to protect her brother. Oh, okay, so she cares about her family. She has some solidarity with with her with at least her family if not people who are who are bullied or outcasted um until she goes to the school with just people who are like that and then and then she hates them too uh also like there's no it's it's super strange because she treats it like it's her old high school like the regular human normie high school but there's no real um like, they don't really do any work to establish that there's a similar kind of social hierarchy uh, or sense of snootiness. Like, the most you really get is that there's one popular girl, the siren girl, that's in her class who's like... But she's just popular because she's, like, top of the top of the class. Like, she's smart and she does sports and, and she's good at stuff. And, yeah, she has a bit of an attitude. I, I think she might... Yeah, like, she she's sort of... Uh, she's sort of mean... Uh, like, okay, I could see Wednesday maybe having a rivalry with her specifically because that seems like it could be in character. Uh, but she sort of just acts that way to everyone, and I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why. There's no scenes of, like, her getting bullied. There's no scenes of other people getting bullied. Like, it would be interesting if you go to this school for, like, monster people, and there's, like, a social hierarchy even there. And, like, that, that might be kind of interesting. Like, you could make some kind of a comment about that. Like, uh, like, hey, have you guys seen Mean Girls with Lindsay Lohan? Because sort of, like, the message of that movie is that, like, Lindsay Lohan thinks that because she's, quote-unquote, not the popular girls, that she's better than them. Uh, and that she's like a literally like a better person that she's superior and then it it that sort of mindset ends up like ends in her basically doing th being very self-centered and actually extremely egotistical and she ends up hurting her friends it's literally where the title of the movie comes from is when her, her best friend like fucking rips into her and tells her that she's a mean girl and she's that's like her wake-up call for her to go oh shit i totally lost track of like stuff that was important to me because I got I, I got too caught up in the social hierarchy. The the like the point, like the broad theme of that movie, as I would interpret it, is that even buying into the social hierarchy at all, uh and even if you are supposedly the, the on the lower rung or on the the oppressed end of that scale and 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 perpetuating that sort of a mindset actually can be really bad for you. It can be it can make you into an equally uh, do equally negative things to you and, and your personality, make you bitter and arrogant and self-righteous, like uh, the person who, like, the, you know, the, oh, you guys, you guys don't like me because I'm so much more, I'm such a, I'm an intellectual, I'm so much smarter than you. Uh, and, and, and it's like, no, it's because you're a fucking weird asshole. And you're just like, it just chill out, like, just, <laughs> you are perpetuating the division between you and other people <laughs> like that would kind of be interesting the show never really does that it never sets up like oh hey, there's actual still still in this literally like a school for what they describe as outcasts there is still social division um uh, no they, they never do that everyone just everyone just seems kind of chill everyone seems pretty nice there's literally one girl who's a little uppity because she has a bit of an ego. And, uh... That's kind of it. Wednesday Adams is Lindsay Lohan's character pre, like, uh, final part of development where she chills out. <laughs> oh, God, okay. So, fucking, when I talk about... Wednesday is literally... She's the worst part of the show. She's the worst part of the show. Especially in the early episodes. Oh, my God, the dialogue. It weirdly gets better... I checked the writers for each episode, and it seems like the first four episodes were one, uh, was like a sort of a, 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 there's people who are consistent across the whole thing, but there's a couple different writers from the first half to the last half of the show. The dialogue, especially at the first three episodes, is so hard. It's so, so hard to listen to. Wednesday 
Adams be this fucking try-hard chuny. That's what she is. That's the vibe that she gives off. She, it's like, maybe I could, can I find like a quote or something? Wednesday dialogue. Uh, uh, fucking uh, Netflix, I guess. It's to like really sell you the cringe. Uh, let's see the thirty-eight best quotes. <laughs> um. Uh, oh, here, where's it? Where's a good one? Give, give me an actual. Give me an actual Wednesday quote. <laughs> uh oh my god oh oh is that where she goes like oh, okay here's one she goes these are all traits of great writers and serial killers when she's talking about her because she's a writer just like me actually um <laughs> uh Oh, she uses the word mansplaining. That was funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, fucking, I'm trying to find... Yes! Oh my god, okay, I haven't talked about Enid. I'll talk about Enid in a second. Enid says, enjoy your solitude, Wednesday. And Wednesday said, it's not your solitude. If you're still here. Oh my fucking... Oh my god. It's real... Okay, I can't deliver it the same way that she does. If you go watch, like, the literally, like, the first two episodes... Every single interaction she has where she's like introducing herself to characters is is like this where they are just they extend nothing but like friendliness and and genuine kindness to her and openness and acceptance and she just responds like she's trying to put them off like in this purposely mean like standoffish way that is really weird and off-putting and what's worse I saw people saying that like What's what's the actress's name? Jenna Ortega, I think, is the main. Yeah, this is, yeah, that's her. I, I thought her name was different, but Jenna Ortega who plays Wednesday. I saw a lot of people saying that she like carried the show. Really, really? I thought like she okay, she does a f okay job for the most part, but like. It might have been the direct... Okay, there's this problem, especially with these, like, super try-hard edgelord lines, where she says the line too fast. She says it, like, too... Like, she's trying... It sounds like she's come up with this fucking zinger in her head. But she doesn't sound confident when she delivers it. She just sounds monotone. And, like, she's trying to sound confident and cool. Which ends up making her sound super fucking lame like i was really really not on board with this character from her introduction like like she says things like she's trying to get the words out, like she's a little too nervous so she's getting the words out a little too fast and it just oh it's so hard to listen to <laughs> it's like someone trying to be cool and if that was the intention bravo a successful portrayal of a really cringy teenager but I feel something tells me that she was supposed to seem cool because no one really reacts like she's embarrassing. <laughs> and it is. She's so embarrassing to watch. Um, other than that, like she does like that. I don't know what that is. It could have been the direction. It could have been, it could just be the dialogue. It could have just been, it could have been her, but like, I did not think her performance was, especially good um and hey speaking of wednesday um not being a likable character i want to get something out of the way uh because I, I think it's important to when i talk about what i don't like about the character um i don't care if a character is not likable a lot of people use a character being unlikable as like a negative against them i don't agree with that uh i um so when uh, in in order for the viewer to be invested into a story they have to uh there's needs to be some kind of in for them like some people you know there are people who will just be invested in whatever story you give them and that's great for them 
Uh, but a lot of people need some kind of a reason to care about the things that are happening. And specifically, uh, what is happening to the characters, or uh, sometimes, I think to a lesser extent, the setting, the, the world. But it really comes down to the characters because that is how uh, we uh, empathize. That, that ta hits us in like empathic parts of our brain and makes us uh, care. It makes us care. We are, the characters are our gateway to caring about the story. Um, so, oftentimes, a, a very tried and true way of doing this is to make a character likable. Because, well, if you like them, it's like if they were a friend or a family member or someone, uh, someone you care about, right? Someone you would care about in real life that you would maybe want to be friends with or that you uh, enjoy seeing, like seeing the exploits of, uh, perhaps. Uh, so naturally, you just kind of like your brain sort of naturally latches on to them because you, you care about you want to see them succeed because you like them in the same way you would want your friend to succeed at something. It's sort of a similar, like, empathic, empathetic relationship. I don't know if empathic is actually the right word. I think it's empathetic. That, that type of a, of a connection in your brain. Uh, uh, it is not the only way, and in, and in fact, there are many uh, characters who are very well liked, who are not likable at all, who, who are still very engaging and, and enthralling. And it's a little trickier and it's a little um, less, well, it's, it's very tried and true, but there isn't like a, um, it, it's a little more, you have to be, you have to like kind of work around the fact that they are not immediately likable. Uh, so there's a quote, there's a YouTuber, uh, one of my big inspirations actually, Rebel Taxi, aka pan pizza he has a video from forever ago where he basically says he had a quote i'm gonna probably misquote this a little bit but the generally what he said was and and i very much like this kind of changed the way that i look at a lot of fiction especially like my own writing and things like that which is a main character does not have to be um likable or relatable they have to be interesting and understandable at bare minimum uh, and so being understandable is related to being relatable and likable, um, but it, it, it's not, uh, it, it's not one-to-one. -one. I would maybe even say that it, uh, under being understandable is like an umbrella for those types of things. Uh, when a character is inter here's a great example, Light Yagami from uh, Death Note. So Light is clearly the villain in Death Note, right? Uh, he he is a, a serial killer. He is he is insane. He's off his rocker, and uh, he's this egotistical maniac. He has a literal god complex. He sees himself as a god in like very clear terms. He believes he like he's the god of the new world is what he sees himself as. But he's a great protagonist because uh, you understand where he's coming from. You can at least understand his thought process and his ideology and his motivations. He explains it very clearly in the first episode. His, his idea about, you know, uh, uh, calling the evil people out of society. It's... Most people would call that wrong, <laughs> but it's at least like an argument. You can at least see how someone would come to that conclusion that he does. There have literally been people in history who have killed a lot of people who have come to that same conclusion. So he's he's understandable. And that, and, and the things that he do, uh, does and the way that he, he uses the Death Note um, and, and his other things like his, his intelligence, uh, the way that he goes about accomplishing his goals is also partially what makes him interesting. The reason, so when you get something interesting, it's like this little food for your brain to like nom on. And I think that that inherently creates a connection between you and the character, or at least the, you know, because of the ideas that they have or that they represent. That your, your brain inherently gets invested because it is like thinking about the ideas that this character uh, puts 
forward. When you hear light, like light is just like he is presenting a, a a very easy to understand moral argument. And you think about it, and even if you don't agree with it, you're at least thinking about it, right? It gives you something to, your brain something to chew on, and that in, in a way makes you invested in the character. Um, there are, are uh, lots of characters who kind of follow in, in a similar vein where, like, you would you don't agree with them at all. They're bad people. They're not likable. They do terrible things. But they give you something to think about. Be one of the great things about art is that it's a way to explore different kinds of ideas. And if a character is not necessarily likable, uh, the author then, or the writer then, has to make the audience invested in them in a, in a different way by making them, uh, I would say, maybe there's other ways that you could do this, but I think making them interesting. Um, like, understanding is, like, the first step to then get to the interesting stuff, if that makes sense. Like, Excuse me. They might go hand in hand. You could probably talk about it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, the issue is that Wednesday is like neither. So there is like I was not invested in her character at all. I did not find her likable, so I didn't. I wasn't invested in that way. Uh, I did not find her interesting, and I did not understand what she felt or, or, or what she what she, what her her beliefs or values are at almost any point like you can again you can sort of pull that she cares about her family but the show she's not with her family for like 90 percent of the show it's like barely a factor there um i uh there's this very odd moment where there's an episode so that the town is supposed to be, supposed to take place in uh vermont which is, uh, I had to remember just now that Vermont is a state. I was like, what, 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 uh, what state is Vermont in? Oh yeah, it's its own state. It's Vermont is one of the teeny tiny little states that's on the east coast of the U.S. And it's so small because it was like a colony. It was one of the, the original like colonies. And that's why, uh, it's shot in Romania. Gorgeous. Like actually beautiful, a lot of beautiful locations in this show. Um, but it takes place in Vermont and, and, and part of, the show, a big element of the show is that the town um, was a, a pilgrim town, and they have uh, this, like, very uh, uh, questionable, like, I think, like, pilgrim world, I think it's called, basically a, a tourist trap based on the story of the pilgrims and, and, and stuff. And it's a very weird callback there's, so there's a moment, so they have to, like, go work. They have to, like, go do some kind of service thing where they go basically volunteer at Pilgrim World. And there's a scene of Wednesday uh, telling these German tourists about the actual horrors that were committed against the Native Americans. <laughs> um, and they all get freaked out and leave. And I thought that was very strange. Because it's this really weird callback to the Adams Family Values from uh, 1993, I believe. Um, I have to go back and double check it, but yeah, it's from that movie. That's where um, Wednesday and Pugsley get sent off to like a, a summer camp, where they have a very similar play about like the first Thanksgiving. Um, and in that movie, it works that she cares about the Native Americans because Wednesday is like not. A total misanthrope she's like very deadpan and she doesn't like get along mainly what it establishes is that Wednesday doesn't really she doesn't dislike people she dislikes people who are fake she doesn't like like she shows up to this camp and there's all of these it, they literally it's like a cartoon that movie's actually quite funny I was rewatching some scenes from it like it's got some pretty funny moments like a lot of really funny quotes and stuff um where the two counselors who are just like the big all smiles and they literally introduce it as like the camp for the young and privileged or something like that. And it's like all white kids. There's just this this plastic sheen over it. And, and it's called like Camp Chippewa, which is a Native American like tribe name. And, and it's very like, which is like this irony, right? And they're putting on this play that is an extreme... Uh, whitewashing revisionist version and it's very like it's very over the top like they refer in this play they like refer to the uh, natives as like 
noble savages and it's like it's incredibly racist um and then the 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 culmination is that wednesday basically leads this little uprising where they they change the dialogue in the play and she has this monologue about what really happened to the native americans um or it's like this in-character monologue about like your your people will drive golf carts mine will drive stick shifts or something like that and then they light the fucking (laughs) set on fire and it's really funny um that like there is a very clear strong establishment of what wednesday cares about she doesn't like they literally get sent at one point in that camp to uh they have to like watch happy like happy video it's it's literally like clockwork orange (laughs) style like they get sent to like the good vibes hut or whatever and they have to watch like cheerful positive programming um to like re-educate them basically to fix their uh fix their um her and the her the other kids dispositions uh and it, and and like that is what she's resenting right so we like i you understand when she does that okay wednesday cares about being genuine and she doesn't like the fact that this camp is this egregious uh whitewashing of history and that everybody uh all, there's a lot of people who are, are very just surface level fake uh, uh uh yeah like like people who don't you know you know exactly what i'm talking about <laughs> i don't want to find all the words to describe it that's what she's rebelling against now i'm not saying that like that's like the wednesday bible right and then you have to pull every interpretation of wednesday from this one movie from 1993 what I am saying is that that movie is, like, 90 minutes, and uh, that's, like, the B-plot of the film, and this show is, like, eight It's like eight hours or something like that, and I feel like I understand substantially more about Wednesday as a character from that B-plot in the one movie compared to the entirety of this Netflix series. She is shockingly, like, poorly defined um like i couldn't tell like i asked i was asking cat i was like why does wednesday care about the plight of the native americans it's really strange i don't like it makes sense to care about it right (laughs) it was a horrible thing that happened but why does wednesday care about it she's so misanthropic and seems to like just love just shitting on people and like society and like we live in a society and and why does she care does she care about marginalized peoples you realize that she's there's some people at this school that have no face they have no faces like they they, they literally like they, they can't go to Kohl's they can't go to Dick's Sporting Goods how do they eat? I don't know. They have no faces. And she fucking, like, hate. This is the school that, like, takes these kinds of people in. And she, like, hates the school? What is... But also... She, like... Like... Cares that native people... That, like, some native people got burned alive, like... 200, 300 years ago. And you're like, What? Why does she give a fuck? Why does she give oh, like 400? Maybe like 400? Eh, whatever. Several hundred years ago, uh, a horrible massacre was committed against many different native peoples by coloni- colonists in in the in the, the the now United States. And why does she care? She loves death. <laughs> she loves people dying. She seems to love like fuck it. Is there a line? I swear to god there's a line of dialogue. Where she talks, oh, um, Ivan the Terrible? Is it Ivan the Terrible? <laughs> uh, yeah, Ivan the Terrible. That's like, she references him as, uh, I'm pretty sure it's him. I'm pretty sure she's the one who references him. Anyway, yeah, uh, the, he, he's called Ivan the Tarot. I don't think, I don't think you, I need to go in depth 
on what kind of a ruler he was. <laughs> um, it's super strange. I don't understand because it's it just doesn't line up with the rest of her character. It feels really out of place, unless she's just do unless she doesn't actually care, and she's just doing it to like burst these tourists' bubble, and to uh, take a stab at the Pilgrim World people. Which, like, uh, yeah, in, like, the Adams Family values, she's kind of doing the same thing, but you sort of get the sense that, like, because there isn't all this other shit of her just hating people, you kind of get the sense that that version of Wednesday, like, has some, like, actual care. Like, she basically tolerates, um... Like people who are, who don't have this, you know, veneer over them. You just sort of get the idea that she's just just sort of deadpan and she doesn't like fake people. And like, yeah, she's taking a stab at them, but she's also making a statement because, like, oh, it's like a big, it's like a big part, like in a very very strong like establishing part of the character that she has some kind of um, because like she experiences in that movie. Where people, like, look at her and uh, they think she's weird. And they immediately discount her because of the way that she looks. So she knows in some sense what it's like to be prejudged by people and to be dismissed by them based off of their appearances. So maybe she has some empathy for marginalized people like the Native Americans. And she dislikes this... Uh, uh, whitewashed version of them like that's something you can pull out of there why does she do that in this show she just kind of seems to hate people in general even people who are super genuine and nice and completely themselves and are nice to her <laughs> uh, so it just kind of ends up with she just doesn't like people and she really has nothing else going on underneath there's this weird weird thing where okay so so there's like five different scenes it feels like in this show where characters other characters like stop her and have a conversation where they very explicitly tell her what all of her problems are like literally all of her flaws and what's wrong with her in the most direct way possible like for instance she basically just uses other people and their desire to be friends with her as a tool to help in her investigation and that results in a lot of people getting hurt in very literal ways the fucking b-boy eugene uh mr b's gets put in a fucking coma He's out of the show for like half half the series after episode four. He gets put in a fucking hospital because of her. And you think like there's these real concrete parts of 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 like um of consequences for her actions. Where you think that like, oh, this is the point where she kind of wakes up. This is her wake-up call. And I'm like, that's a good one. because Specifically when Eugene gets uh, nae on. Because that's like episode four that happens. Like right in the middle of the series. And you're like, holy shit. This, and she's like standing in the hospital uh, room. His two gay moms come in. And they're like upset. And they're like, because their little boy it got fucking attacked by a big monster. He's in a coma. And you're like, oh my god, maybe this is the point. And Eugene is like the most... Eugene would, he should be the type of person Wednesday empathizes with. He's not even a popular kid. He's this weird fucking little guy who likes bees. And he hangs out in this part, this weird little like corner of the school on the outside where he's got the little, he's got all the bee hives and he just likes bees and he doesn't know how to talk to girls. And he's kind of this awkward little funny guy. Uh, and you would think, and, and he's like super on board with her. And he's, like, told, like, you would think that they, that she would at least, like, you know, care about him. 
And it's and and when she finds him, when she finds him all fucked up and like passed out, and I was like, holy shit, is he actually dead? Because that's kind of how it's presented. She has this really like intense expression. It's like some of the most expressive acting Jenna Ortega does in the whole series. And 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 she looks like angry and upset and devastated and it's like oh my god and then you cut to this all this stuff in the hospital and you're like oh my god this is gonna be the moment this is gonna be where she starts the, this is gonna be the turning point this is gonna be the catalyst for her starting to uh soften up and change her ways and 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 who the fuck is moving around at fucking 3 30 a.m in this house um and like, okay, this is where the character development starts. Oh, first half she's gonna be this total asshole. Second half she's gonna get she's gonna get um she's gonna start learning and, and changing her ways a little bit. And, and then it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen, and I don't know why. She does the exact same thing again. She takes like two of her friends to the fucking danger house that she like has a strong suspicion has a connection to the monster. And then guess fucking what? One of them gets injured. Gets like severe, like gets all these fucking gashes across his chest and shit. I, and it's like, why the fuck do you, what, 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 like she doesn't change at all. And it's super weird because on top of these like serious consequences that happen as a result of her actions of people who she should care a little bit about getting like physically hurt like put in the hospital you also have these scenes which almost feel like they're for the audience of the of characters again this happens like five times of characters telling her specifically what her problem is like you're a fucking asshole you're a misanthrope you don't care about other people you're egotistical everything's about you you use other people as pawn. They use the term pawn like a hundred times in this show because that's how she fucking sees people. That's literally how she uses people in her little fucking investigation game, which I don't, again, don't know why she's even bothering with. And then she like doesn't change. She changes in like the weakest way possible. Like, like she says like, thank you, I think twice. Like it has to be forced out of her. She, like, is moderately, like, neutral towards the people who have done nothing but help her and be friendly to her. Enid. My my poor, poor, sweet Enid, my beloved. Enid is the best character in this show. Enid is the best character. That's uh, Wednesday's roommate, the blonde girl, who you might have seen on Twitter, where they pin them as, like, this weird lesbian couple or whatever. And they, like ship them together no stop doing that it, i could not believe enid okay enid is like the, she's the best part of the show every scene she is so energetic she's so bubbly she's so cute she's so cute she's so happy every single scene she's in she makes it more fun she makes it more entertaining she's such she's such a joy every time she's on screen her actress does a wonderful job um, and, and like, like there's like, there's like, there's an episode where, um, they, they're, they're like little dorm has to like, uh, do a, uh, they do like a canoe race. It's this whole thing. And then they win, they win the, the big cup, they win the cup and, and Enid is so excited. She's like jumping up and down with it. She's so happy. And then you cut to like later that night and in like the panning shot of the room, Enid is like asleep with like, she's holding the cup in her arms, <laughs> like a, like a body, like an anime body pillow. And it's so, it's so cute. I love her. <laughs> and Wednesday fucking hates her. She hates her, and you know why? You know, you know why she doesn't like her? She doesn't like her because uh, she listens to pop music and she uh, wears pink, and she has plushies. That's and she has and she's bright and cheery, and she's friendly and asks her friendly questions and tries to be her friend when they're literally roommates. They're literally roommates. It, like you would imagine, like Enid, if your roommate. If you go to college or boarding school and your roommate is Enid, you won the lottery. 
This is exactly the kind of person that you want, that you want in, in your dorm, in your room. She's just nice. She's just this nice, sweet girl. And when's, and that's completely her. That's just genuinely who she is. There's no, like, veneer. There's no layer of false, you know, personality or persona. And Wednesday is just a fucking asshole to her for no reason. And it sucks. It's so, it's so disappointing. It's so, it's, there's like, and every character is somewhat like this. And it's weird because everyone keeps trying to be her friend. There's this character, Xavier. He's the uh, white guy with the long hair. Xavier, at every point in the show, does the right thing, pretty much. He does the right thing. He he he's he's friendly to he his introduction in the first fucking episode he saves her life like twice. He saves Wednesday's life twice. Just just because he's a good guy. Just because he's a good guy. And he kind of has a crush on her, right? He sort of has this crush on her and he's just trying to be friendly and he's not like pushy about it. He's not weird about it. Not really. Like he this is fucking Wednesday goes into his personal spaces, like she sneaks into like his room in this little ha this little shack where he's doing art, and she finds that like you know he's made some paintings of her, and she he's been like sketching her. That's like the worst thing that he does is oh he did some kind of cringy, but that's like fucking who, can it's it's not even like particularly weird or anything, artwork. It's just it's just her, it's just the 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 stuff that like you know you do when you have a crush on someone. And you, like, write a little fan fiction about going on a romantic date. <laughs> uh, it's, you, just, you just don't want them to find it because that would be horribly embarrassing. <laughs> it's, like, the worst thing he does is he does cringy stuff that you do when you're, like, a teenager with a crush. Every other point in the show, he pretty much does, like, nothing weird. There's, like, sort of stuff that might connect him to the monster, but there's, like, really nothing conclusive. And he does everything right. He saves her life. He's nice to her. He's friendly. And again, not in like a weird way, like he's just trying to get with her. Like he's just nice. He listens to like her little theories about the monster. He supports her in like her investigation stuff. And he doesn't seem to be doing it with any kind of ulterior, like, you know, super ulterior motive besides like, oh, I want to like be around her because I like her. He's like a pretty nice guy. And what does he get? He just gets punished for it. He gets thrown in jail. Wednesday has him thrown in jail. She frames him on a bad assumption. On a, on a bad assumption that he's the monster. And he's fucking in the cell. He's in the cell and she goes to see him and he fucking rips her a new one. And he just says, he's like, what the fuck? I have done nothing but be nice to you. I have done everything to help you. And I've just been a fucking good person. <laughs> Why? Why did would you do this? What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> on just like a guess? On like a strong hunch? You're gonna have me thrown in prison? Oh. Oh my god. What the fuck is her problem? And that's the issue is that like you never really find out. Why? Why does Wednesday hate people so much? Why does she hate people so much? If I at least knew. If I at least knew. But even establishing that, like, I don't know, giving her some kind of weird backstory of, like, bad experiences she had. or something, Like, I don't, like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't I have no idea what her internal logic is at almost any point in the show. She's just kind of doing things. And that's why... The show doesn't really have plot holes, at least that I picked up on. But people overuse the term plot hole a lot. To just refer to, like, stuff that they don't like or contrivances. And it's, that's what this show really just has, is that it basically skates by on contrivances. Of, like, okay, there's, like, information, and then the characters take that information and they stretch it out to a conclusion that's kind of... Eh, like, why would you do that with this? How did you... Why would you do that with... 
Like, there's a scene where the mayor gets hit by a car, right? And he's in critical condition in the hospital. Wednesday gets back to the school, and there's really no other details other than the mayor was hit by a car, and he's in critical condition. And she gets back to the school, and the principal is like... And this is like the only thing that's happened, and then she goes... The, she tells her that the school is under lockdown. And it's like, why is the school under, like, the prince, like, the mayor got hit. It, it, he got sent to the hospital in, like, a hit and run. Like, could it have been attempted murder? Maybe. Uh, perhaps. Uh, you know, the, 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 the setup was that the mayor was coming back from, like, uh, the danger spooky house with supposedly information... Uh, that would be like a key, a key linchpin in the in the murder case in the in the monster murders case, and he gets hit, and so they have a suspicion, obviously, that it has to do with that, but like they don't know, and like so then why, why does the school go on lockdown? There isn't like a rash of people getting hit by cars. If it was like a student died or something. Okay, well, then I'd understand, like, don't let anyone leave the premises. But it just kind of happens. She just sort of says the school's on lockdown. And not really why, and this is really the only thing that could have caused that. And all it really does is just add another layer of, like, oh, well, now when Wednesday sneaks out, it's, like, really... Like, she's really breaking the rules now. Is it? okay <laughs> i don't get it did someone get like monster covid or something like that is there an outbreak of monster pox is that a goosebumps book is monster pox a goosebumps book it sounds like it is nope i just made that up it sounds like something that would be real yep oh uh it is an episode of the muppets <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, it just there's all these weird little contrivances. Oh god, episode five is this really weird. Cat described it as soon as it started. She described it as a filler episode, and it basically is. It, it's so strange. So basically, like, the idea is that it's it's um, it's a family day or it's like family week or something like that. Basically, the family comes in and they stay to visit the you know the kids. The students and uh, so the Adam, the rest of the Adams family comes. People were dogging on the casting choices, uh, specifically for Gomez. I enjoyed the Gomez guy. I like that he's just kind of a big fella. Um, I think the main problem is is with uh, the script because the script is so fucking serious, and Gomez is such a funny character. Uh, that like like oh my like Raul Julia in that movie is so <laughs> oh my god so when they go to the camp in like Adam's family values it's because like Pugsley Pugsley got in trouble at school or something so they're like sending him off to, to summer camp and uh, so they meet this family and and they just have this like perfect prim proper little daughter and and the father is like oh she our little Jessica is is just she she's such a She's such a promising young lady. Oh, uh, you know, she she just this year she skipped two grades of school. What about your boy, Gomez? Or or Adam? Like, what about your son? And then he just grabs Pugsley <laughs> by like the shoulder, and he's all super proud and beaming, and he goes, Probation. <laughs> like there's just this physicality and this fucking del- like he's so goofy, he's great. Um, I, I like, I feel like this actor could probably do a good job as, as Gomez. He's just really given nothing funny to do because the show is so serious. The entire episode is about how there's this space. Okay. So there's this thing that gets set up at the start. One of the key characters in this like love triangle that barely feels like a love triangle, which is why I I haven't even talked about it. Cause it's like, oh, I guess it's a love triangle is, is, um, the sheriff's son, I think his name is Tyler. So the sheriff's son, in like the first episode, uh, his dad says something about the Adams family. And he has like a grudge against them. So the, the son goes and looks on the files and he finds that Gomez uh, had this case against him for murder like 30 years ago. when he himself was at the, at the same high school that Wednesday's at. And uh, you basically 
that's sort of like why uh, Tyler gets interested in Wednesday and why he like because uh, uh, he's like a barista at, the, at this coffee shop that she goes to and so he's just kind of curious about her and that's sort of like how their relationship together sort of starts and this weirdly enough this whole plot line about the Adams family having this kind of you know or Gomez having this dark thing he did in the past uh doesn't really go anywhere besides this episode it feels like it was just there to to like set up why <laughs> why Tyler would be interested in Adams in the Adams family <laughs> excuse me and then it, it it just sort of ends up uh just going nowhere until this episode where they're like oh fuck I guess we got to take care of that um and uh, it basically turns out that, like, uh, Gomez and Morticia were, like, super into each other in high school. But there was this guy, I think it's from, the, like, the, it's like the Gates family. Like, their, one of their sons was obsessed with Morticia. And uh, he's a normie. I fucking hate that they use that word. And he's basically, he, he, he like, 30 years ago, he goes, there was, like, a dance at the, at the school. And uh, he goes and he, his, his dad is a monster racist. He hates outcast people. Fucking hates Andre 3000. And big boy. And uh, he basically sends his son in to, like, go um, uh, poison the dance with, like, nightshade. Like, he's going to spike the punch. <laughs> and uh, uh, this fucking thing happens where he sees Gomez and Morticia making out. And he just gets, like, overcome with rage. And, like, in this scuffle that he and Gomez have, the, the the nightshade, like, the bottle breaks. And it, like, absorbs into his skin. And he starts getting poisoned. And it, it ends up culminating in this, like, sword fight that they have, like, on the on the scaffolding of the school. Like, over the over the uh, courtyard. Um, and all that, all that every, everyone knows is that Gomez stabbed the Gates guy. And he, he, he's like, he was on, he got a murder charge against him. And then I forget exactly how he got out of it, but something happened, right? And then this whole episode is uh, basically, oh, well, what it really was, was, well, technically Morticia stabbed him. All right. Um, Morticia stabbed the guy. Um, but Gomez took the fall for her. And, uh, and, and you find, and then like, they have to find, so, so Gomez comes back. The family comes back. Gomez gets arrested uh, because there's like new evidence against him or whatever, and he's basically been framed by someone. And um, th and the the uh, God, fucking, this is so weird. And okay, if I remember correctly, Gomez goes to prison. And instead of, like, having a trial, he just signs a confession, and they're like, well, you're going to jail, like, without a trial or anything. And then Wednesday and Morticia show up, and they go, actually, he had, the guy was being poisoned when he got stabbed. So the stabbing actually had nothing, so the part where he got stabbed and then fell, like, three stories and hit the ground and fucking exploded, um, that had nothing to do with him dying, because uh, he, was, he was being already poisoned. And the mayor, who was the sheriff at the time that this happened, just goes, well, I guess my hands are tied. Gomez is free. And you're like, what? What? Why, why would he... Why would he do that? Why would he give in to... The, if someone watched this and, and remembers it, like, differently, and, like, and I'm being wrong here, tell me? Because I was like, I just, like, and it happened so fast. Like, like, I was talking to a friend the other day, and they were like, yeah, about this scene. And he's like, dude, when you sign, like, a confession, you're, like, fucking in jail. Like, that's the end of it, basically. Like, it doesn't, I guess because they're corrupt, but in the good way here? What? It just, it, what? Um, and Gomez is just, like, super solemn. And he's not written like any other version of Gomez, where he's, like, all goofy and happy and and taking it in stride. And it, it I saw, like, a comment that was like, wouldn't Gomez... G 
Gomez would be, like, stoked about going to prison. And he would, like, fucking make friends with all the prisoners or something. And, and then, like, it would just be... It would get into, like, wacky hijinks. But the show takes itself so goddamn seriously that they, they, there's this, like, serious-ass segment of of Gomez going to prison. And it's like, what? What the heck? Okay. And it's weird, because I feel like this... This whole thread could have been used so much better. Now, it's usually considered like an arrogant thing uh, to like say that you could have done, written something better or done something better than another person. Um, I'm going to be arrogant and I'm going to say that I could because we're talking about Wednesday's motivation for solving the mystery. And personally, I think that whatever I could come up with is better than what the show gives, which is nothing. Uh, so here we go. We're going to do a little brainstorming. Okay, so Wednesday is at this school. <clears throat> uh, we already know that the Adams have this sort of dark history in this town with this murder that happened that was never, like, given closure on. Uh, and, and specifically, uh, this murder of this, this son had, like, a, ripple, a big ripple effect where all the other members of the family either they, they, they died in some way. Uh, it basically set off this chain of events where every single one of them died either by offing themselves um, or just, you know, drinking. I think one of them, like, the dad drunk himself to death. Um, they say that the daughter, uh, like, got shipped overseas and then drowned on the voyage. Um, just a disaster. And this was the, the first domino to topple over this whole family. Um, okay, so... There, there's like this grudge against the Adams, but you know the case was never proved or something like that. There's this grudge against the Adams, right, and the Adams family that maybe the the current sheriff and the mayor, who was the old sheriff, might still have against them, right? That they, they might be biased against them, or specifically Wednesday, um, because the dad immediately has it out for her, and he and he's like, oh god, an Adams, yeah, fucking her dad's a fucking monster. He's an asshole. He killed this guy, and that caused his whole family to die, um. And then we have this element of Wednesday being the only person present when this kid Rowan dies. The first murder that we see of the monster, right? Or the first, like, on-screen murder that the time she encounters the monster. Why not just, like, shift a couple things around and say, hey, uh, uh, before they had, maybe let's say that this Gates family had, like, an older son or daughter. Let's say daughter. Let's say daughter. And that she had a child who is like now an adult uh but now this kid has a new this, the, her son has a new last name and his son is rowan or something and his son is rowan and that's why she doesn't they don't immediately uh, you know she could do a little investigating to see the connection between rowan and this gates family and the thing that her dad did or you know the, the death that happened 30 years ago so that could give her a little bit of thrust to investigate that and see what's going on. But specifically, um, maybe she could be uh, uh, in the moment, let's say. Let's, let's go back a couple steps. She's the only one who's there when Rowan is killed. What if, if you want to play into the, the sheriff and the mayor being corrupt and having it out for the Adams, why not do a thing where Wednesday is implicated in his murder? Why not have it so that she is basically framed via just, you know, assumption that, that people don't believe that it's a monster, that they think it's a wild animal or something like that. <clears throat> and and they say, well, no, when's the, the monster didn't do this. You would have to, like, change some ways of, like, you know, his injuries and stuff like that. But because uh, uh, there's also, like, again, oh, yeah, so the scene where Rowan dies, did I even mention this? Did I even mention this before? Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's like the, the, the first, like, time that, yeah, his death, right, I, I did kind of explain it a little bit. So, his deal, and the reason that he was confronting her in this sort of secluded part of the forest, is that his mother was like a psychic, and she saw, had this vision that Wednesday was going to destroy the school. Oh, and he wanted to kill her first. Why don't we just move this over a little bit and say, well... His mother is from the Gates family, and she, like, say, let's say she, his grandmother, sorry, his grandmother um, was from the Gates family, and she died. Um, and maybe his, his, one of his, like, his mom died or something like that, or whoever 
his grandma's kid was. And it had this, this ripple effect extended out to, like, his immediate family. And that he's basically, he's, he's trying to finish, finish it. He's going to finish this grudge against her. And he doesn't give a fuck. Because he's already going to kill her, right? He's already going to kill her. So he doesn't care. He just wants to uh, uh, finish, he just wants to get revenge on the Adams. Uh, let's just say that that was that was what was going on, right? You could even keep the part about um, the this psychic vision and stuff, and just say, oh yeah, his mom was also psychic because he has psychic powers. So he was psychic, or the the you know one person in the family, maybe like the, his mom. Uh, let's say the grandma married like a a, a a weirdo weirdo person. And then that's where that's where he gets it from because the original Gates family was all normies, and so th this this could all be things that Wednesday goes into and investigates. Like, why did this guy try to kill me? What the fuck happened? What's the connection? Um, and th th then basically structure the series a little differently so that the so Wednesday gets implicated, and now that puts immediate pressure on her to find out what's going on with the murders because one she wants to clear her name she wants to clear her her family's name and because her initial goal is to just escape the school if you like running from the scene of the crime now that she's already under suspicion for rowan's murder running from the scene of the crime is considered an extremely guilty thing to do I, there's like a specific term for it um but like that's if you uh, commit a cr if you if you're under like heavy suspicion that you did something and you fled that is considered like partly some admission of guilt that would look really bad for her so she can't leave um she can't continue her original goal of trying to leave so now she's basically forced into uh solving the mystery and clearing her name and at the same time you can say that she is solving uh the mystery of the murders of who actually killed rowan and she's solving uh, the mystery of what actually happened with uh, Gomez and the Gates guy. And then kind of structure it differently so that instead of being awkwardly kind of plopped into the middle of, um, of, the, of the show. Oh, oh, do it like this. Oh, have, have the family come out. Have like Gomez and Morticia come out. Like immediately as soon as this happens because they want to see their kid. And they're like, because they love their kid, they're going to come back and they're like, holy shit, we have to check up on her. Gomez gets arrested because of like a framing thing. Now there's immediate pressure and the trial ha unfolds as like a basically a side plot over the course of the series. So you have Wednesday at the school doing her little magical investigation thing. Uh, getting in, And then her like getting involved, messing with the trial, um, trying to find evidence. Uh, and then culminating in, let's say, the second to last episode uh, is when Gomez's name is cleared. And then you can do the rest of whatever the fuck you want to do with the monster murders, right? I feel like that would have been such a stronger motivation. You would have gotten, you would get to have more of Gomez. Uh, you would get to have more of Morticia, who I also enjoyed. She was, I liked, I liked uh, her, her mannerisms were fine. Um, she did, a, I thought she did a decent job of playing Morticia. I like her big goth boobs. Uh, I like her big, big, funny, frilly dress. It's not really frilly. It's just kind of f f flowy. Um, you just get to have more of, like, those characters. Give Gomez, like, a fucking sense of humor about the situation. Don't make him so goddamn stoic and serious and solemn. Uh, and I feel like... And then Wednesday would have a motivation. You would get to have more interactions between her and her, her, her parents. You get to, like, because we obviously start with this establishing that, that uh, part, like, uh, part of, like, scene of her character, again, that she cares about her family because she defends Pugsley and she's willing to go to great lengths to defend her family. That would explain why the fuck she's putting her life in so much danger. That could explain why she's putting other people's lives in danger, because maybe she cares about her family and that supersedes her care for other people, right? And maybe she can learn a little bit about friendships and, and, and having care for, <clears throat> for other people who are not in her immediate family. Um, there are so many ways that like this could... I feel like you could have structured that this whole thing better so that it just came out a lot stronger, and, and and 
as it is, it's, yeah. Is there anything else I wrote? Um, da, 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 da. yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, oh man, the ending of this show is fucking schlock. It's schlock. So the, the twist is that the one normie uh, teacher at the school who is uh, Christina Ritchie, who played Wednesday in the uh, old 90s movies. She is actually the daughter who supposedly drowned at sea from the Gates family. And again, why do uh, why is why is the thing with Gomez just dropped? Why is that thing just dropped, like just resolved in the middle of the show? And when you have a villain whose motivation involves that, oh my god, why wasn't it a culmination at the end? Um, wouldn't that be a great part of the show? Of, like, the court case where they find out that Christina Ritchie is actually the daughter? Wouldn't that be wild? Like, that feels like something that would come out in the investigation. Um... Uh, it's super weird how, like, there's no trial. Like, the Adams family is rich. Why don't they even have, like, they could pay a lawyer? Like, you can just fucking lawyer your way out of a bunch of stuff, right? Um, right, uh, rock on track. She was the, the daughter who supposedly drowned, but she, she didn't die, and she comes back to teach at this school, and when Wednesday is there, she, there's this kid. It's Tyler. It's the sheriff's son who is a, a hide. He's like a Jekyll and Hyde, so he he can transform into a big monster, and he loses all of his all of his senses, basically. And she basically uh, is manipulating and controlling him to commit these murders, so uh, that she can collect body parts to perform a ritual that will resurrect the founder of the town, who was just a very racist pilgrim man. But resurrecting him will also make who hated outcasts. But resurrecting him will also like he is like a evil demon like magic. He has powers now, which is weird. Isn't wasn't he just a guy? Does he get? Do you suddenly get powers when you get resurrected by dark magic? Is what is going on? Okay. Whatever. It really feels like they were like, fuck, we need to have this build to a whole thing. We need to have a big schlocky action sequence with a bunch of uh, nonsense. And, and then it's just, dude, it, it goes so fast. It's it's wild. It's like, it's like Xavier gets thrown in jail. Tyler, in front of like a bunch of people at the, at the, at the sheriff's office just tells Wednesday that he's the murderer and that he fucking loves murder and killing people. And then... And then... Uh, uh, oh, God. And then she fucking, like, runs off to go, like, stop this ritual from happening or, or something. And then she gets stabbed. And then she's, like, bleeding out. Uh, and then uh, uh, the CEO of racism gets resurrected and she they leave. They don't like make sure she is dead. He just kind of oh no, he stabs her. She gets a, she gets really fucked up at a couple points and she gets like stabbed and then she gets um, oh no, she went to confront Christina Ritchie. Christina Ritchie hits her over the head with a shovel. Uh, <laughs> takes. Her, oh, she takes her to the, 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 the mausoleum with the CEO of racism because she needs Wednesday's blood for some reason? For some reason? Um, is it, I think it's because, like, Wednesday's ancestor killed racist guy. And, and then, so she's been seeing these visions of this, her ancestor, who's like a little, little pilgrim girl who looks like her, but is blonde. And, um... Uh, so she's like bleeding out on the floor and the pilgrim girl comes up she sees she appears and she goes Wednesday I can uh give you a quick quick res but you'll never see me again and I'm like and then she's Wednesday's like sure and then the ghost girl just puts her hands on the wounds and everything heals and she like absorbs into her and then she's gone forever oh no 
we'll never see that character again. What a loss. And Wednesday just gets up and she's fucking like, she has like the tiramisu from Vampire Survivors. She just, broom, she just gets a, gets a quick res, quick revive. <laughs> she had her GA. Um, bitch, I'm back out my coma. And then she goes and uh, gets a sword and stabs the CEO of racism in the chest. And then he, ex <laughs> and then he explodes um, and then before that, there's this whole sequence where he wants to burn the school down, and he's, like, letting out these waves of fire, and he's going, ah, I'm so racist, ah, my racism fire, and then he gets stabbed in the chest and explodes, and it's like, yay, <laughs> this, this Wednesday has saved the school, from burning down this school that she's done nothing but talk about how badly she wants to jihad from like the first day she's been there. She saved it, guys, because she cares about what exactly? Why? Like, it's so weird because it seems like the obvious thing that most good, decent people would do would be to stop this guy. But, like, why, besides the fact that, you know, he wants to kill her, I guess that's a fine motivation, but, like, it's so, it's like, it should be, it should be a moment, right? It should be a moment that that's, like, the, the climax of these themes that the show should have been building up of, like, oppressor, the oppressor being defeated by the oppressed and, 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 and all that. Like, he's literally... A, a racist genocidal pilgrim who hates specifically outcast people um and, and like this should be a scene where sh that they're like culminating that conflict but it's like nothing i just got there's just like nothing to it because wednesday seems to just fucking hate those people anyway <laughs> why did she do it what does she care what? Uh, and then Christina Ritchie comes out with the with the Glock, and she's gonna sh shoot Wednesday. But then B Boy comes back and he unleashes. <laughs> he unleashes a swarm of bees on her, and she starts firing into the swarm of bees, and then. And then I don't know how she gets downed exactly. Sure. Fucking sure. It's just, it's so, it really feels like they fucking ran out of ideas. It really feels like they're like, eh, big fucking schlock action ending with like zero thematic relevance zero anything it's just so weak and then and then fucking everyone's just cool and fucking enid poor poor enid there's this thing throughout the show where uh so enid's like a werewolf girl right but she hasn't she hasn't she hasn't gone full wolf she hasn't gone full silly mode yet um she can do a little claw action but she hasn't gone to a full ass, full on furry transformation yet. And there's like this bit that's kind of amusing during like the, the parent week episode where her parents show up and like her mom is very overbearing and like, uh, fucking she's a lot. Um, and the dad like doesn't say shit. <laughs> and he just kind of stands there and just kind of smiles. And, like, uh, and her mom wants her to go to werewolf conversion camp <laughs> because she's worried about Enid like not having her wolf transformation soon enough and uh, it's like kind of amusing and I'm like damn I hope Enid gets out of this one alright and I think she just tells her to fuck off at the end and I'm like yeah you go, you go Enid you stand up for yourself <laughs> so everything's fucking going to shit 
uh, monster, the monster mash is a uh, fucking uh, bashing around in the forest. Tyler in his in his monster hide form, and uh, Enid, in order to protect uh, someone or other, I think, uh, fucking goes full silly mode, and she has her first big werewolf transformation, and uh, she and uh, Tyler monster have a. Uh, CGI fight scene in the extreme dark. I love CGI scenes in heavy darkness where you can't make out the bad CG. <laughs> Netflix CG. It's whatever. So she fucking, uh, she fucking ends up molly whopping him. Fucking. And she gets fucked up. She gets fucked up. All the students are freaking out. They're like in in um. They've all like evacuated the school because she's um because of uh, uh pilgrim man is coming, and they've all evacuated to for their safety. They're all basically standing outside in the in like on the premises, and then Enid walks out of the out of the forest and she's like shaking and she's all fucked up and her face is covered in blood and she just looks terrified and and she's just slowly walking out and i'm like oh my god someone give her a hug someone give her a hug and then and then you know what after all the shit that wednesday has put her through and 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 all all the all the just fucking the, the what a terrible friend she's been to her you know what she says you know what what Enid says as she walks up and she sees one of her like this guy she kind of like they had a crush on. She says, "She goes, where is Wednesday?" After all that, after all that, she's still because she's fucking nice because she's a nice fucking person. And and she just she just needs a hug. <laughs> and then Wednesday walks out, having just uh, made uh, Pilgrim Man die. And she gives Enid a hug, and I'm like, not from her! What an email did I get? Jesus Christ. I'm like, not from her! Fucking anyone else other than Wednesday? Fuck her! Why does anyone even bother with Wednesday at this point? She does nothing for anyone! She's just, she's just a fucking... Like, why does anyone bother with her? And then you get to this scene, like, at the end, like, when they're wrapping everything up and they're going away for, they're going back home for break. And Xavier, who, again, did everything right and got punished, is, he, like, buys her a phone? Or he gives her a phone? I'm like, did he buy that for her? Because he doesn't have a phone, because she because that's what normies use. And I'm like, did he buy that for her? And he goes, like, hey, keep in touch. I'm like, Why? Is he paying for her phone bill? What the fuck? What is happening here? What? Why would you ever want to talk to this person again? Holy shit. Oh my god. It's like, it's so weird. Wednesday has, as a character, has like nothing going for her. She has nothing going on. There's nothing under the surface to make her even remotely interesting. She's just a terrible person. And it could and her kind of like dark personality. Like it could be funny until you get to a scene where she thinks Tyler now is the monster and she's right, but she doesn't know this for sure. And she and a bunch of the other kids basically kidnap him and fucking throw him in a shed. And they can't they basically just question him and he's like he's like chained up in a chair and I'm like this is a little intense. But uh, okay. And they're asking him, she's asking him, she's interrogating him, and he basically says he doesn't know what, what she's talking about, and she's wrong, and he denies everything. And she opens up her bag, and she pulls out, like, a saw? And hammer? And the other kids are like, wait, what are you gonna, what, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm going to, she says she's going to torture him. She's going to torture the information out of him. And it's like, in a more lighthearted show or adaptation, this could be played as like a comedy bit. 
this could be played as, as like a, a, a spit of dark comedy, right? Um, but here, it's so self-serious that it's not funny at all. It's just fucking insane. And rightfully, all the other characters who were backing her up on this piece out. And they're like, this is way too far. What the fuck? And they all leave to go tell the principal about what's happening. And, and like, the principal goes to, she calls the sheriff. She tells her what's going on. And the sheriff ends up busting in just in time. Wednesday is about to hit him in the head with a hammer. With a hammer. She's about to fucking split his skull open with a hammer in a shed on a strong assumption that she she got it from a vision because she had a vision. Here's another thing that fucking visions. Did I even bring this up? So Wednesday, oh my God. So Wednesday has this thing and it's established in the first episode that she has these psychic visions. Right? It's like, okay, we're, we're doing a new thing with Wednesday. She gets these psychic visions of the future or sometimes the past, right? And the way that these visions prop up is they're essentially used by the writers as just a little, like, hint button that they just kind of toss Wednesday every once in a while so that she can, like, figure something out or get a piece of information that they can't otherwise figure out, like, how to... how she would find... And you feel like, it feels like at some point in the writer's room, they thought, oh wait, that's too easy, like that's too cheap to just be like a free hint. So uh, let's write in a couple lines of dialogue that gets repeated every so often about how, um, about how her, the psychic visions are notoriously unreliable and they can be wrong and, and misleading. And then, um... So they say that, they say this like three times throughout the show, right? They're, they're notoriously misleading and, and, and unreliable and they don't show the whole picture. And I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the part of the show where Wednesday um, makes an assumption based off of a vision that turns out to be totally wrong or she didn't see the full picture and she made a bad assumption and she the, she pays the price for it, right? And, 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 and she gets a little bit humbled and, and stuff like that. And then it just doesn't happen. It never happens. Every single vision, and she gets one like almost every episode at least once. Every single vision she gets is completely spot on. Completely spot on. And you would think in a series that has this many, one thing that it does do is that it does hand a lot of like red herrings out where I was, okay, I was kind of interested in the way that they told the mystery, right? To give the show props, I was, I didn't find the pacing and the way that the information was generally doled out to actually be pretty solid as as a mystery i'm not a mystery connoisseur so i can't say if it was how good it stacks up in the genre but i can at least say that for me as a viewer who's not really into it that i actually enjoyed that part of the show on um, um, you know if you ignore the fact that she has no motivation and that there's a lot of contrivances with like character reasoning and stuff like that 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 the actual d investigation itself is pretty well executed it's pretty engaging and i think that's part of what makes the show watchable um but there's never a moment where where they use the visions for that and it's strange because it's like they set it up it's like this really clear obvious setup that something's going to happen and and it and even if you see it coming it can still work because wednesday might you could, wednesday oh wednesday just has such a big ego she's so full of herself that uh she doesn't that she thinks uh, that she doesn't doubt her visions a single time and she ends up paying the price and she has a learning moment something like that you know the character changes a little bit but that never happens that never happens and the more that i talk about this show and the more that i think about it the more I realize it's it, it's really fucking bad in a lot of ways. Like, oh my god. There's so many fucking issues with it. And it's just propped up by decent pacing and a couple likable characters. That's really it. I think this show kind of sucks ass in a lot of ways. <laughs> like, it's crazy. 
Was there anything else I forgot about? There's like so many examples where it's like, this should be the learning moment for Wednesday, but it never is. Like how far, how, hard, how, how much does she need to suffer before she changes even a little bit? And she never does. She was, again, she does like a little bit. She does a teeny weeny bit, but like not in a, like a substantial way where you're like, whoa, that was, oh, I see. This is, and like, yeah, you can argue that, <sighs> hey, you know, season two got greenlit. Maybe it'll really start happening in season two. Um, but as for now, this is just one season. And there really isn't any turning point where I can see the character getting at all better. And again, I, I want to restate this. I don't need her to get better. She could get worse for all I care. But if you're going to have so many moments and so many, like, obvious setups for a character arc in, like, a positive direction, why are you not following through on them? Why do you have, like, five scenes of characters telling her what her flaws are and then nothing really changes? Why do you have these scenes where Eugene gets hurt, uh, Tyler gets hurt, he, he fakes the injury, but, but they don't know that at the time, uh, Thing. Oh, I forgot to mention Thing. Thing is fine. Um, he's kind of enjoyable to watch, but I, I have this problem, and this is a very personal problem, where I hate the sound design of Thing because he's really thumpy, and it, like, there's, like, a body horror element to it matched with, like, the thumpy way that, like, every time he's, like, walking around because the whole hand, that, um, really, uh, like, I don't like, that, like, really gives me the heebie-jeebies in, like, a bad way. Um, yeah, I'm very vulnerable to, like, body horror stuff, so Thing kind of hits that for me in a way that I... Uh, uh, it just kind of makes me eke out. That's a personal thing. I think overall, it's, like, Thing's pretty enjoyable. Um, but there's, like, this, you know, Thing, uh, uh fucking Wednesday, get, she goes too far at one point in her investigation. Someone raids her dorm, finds this book that she collected that had some evidence steals it, and then uh, s literally stabs Thing to a fucking wall. And, oh, Thing is like her family, basically. She considers Thing part of her family, and she's genuinely super fucking upset by this. And she's like, this is the Uncle Fester episode. Wow, a lot of people did not like Uncle Fester. I loved Uncle Fester. Um, he's Fred Armisen in this. He is just delightful. He is so hammy. He feels like he's coming from a different show. And I kind of love that, because I feel like it's a show that I would rather be watching. I want to watch, like, a little special or a little movie about Uncle Fester doing funny um, criminal hijinks stuff, where he's being a goofball and, um, and, and being silly and being a kind of wacky, like, sort of... He's just supernatural enough. Like, he just kind of disappears and reappears. He uh, has weird electricity powers in this for some reason. Um... But he's really, he's delightful. I enjoyed him quite a bit. And uh, he sort of suffers from the fact that he's used to deliver a lot of exposition, which is very, exposition is just, I find, it's very ham-fisted exposition, and I find that very, like, hard to watch and cringy. Um, but everything that is not that is, is very enjoyable. And she takes him to Uncle Fester, and then he basically uses his electricity powers to, like, try to revive Thing. And it seems like... Thing is really going to die. And I'm like, oh my god. And I don't know if I necessarily wanted that, but I think it would have been good. I genuinely think it would have been good for her character if fucking Thing died. Because if anything, it could have been something to actually push her over the edge of wanting to improve a little bit and maybe, like, grow up a little bit. Like, oh, like... So it's, like, not working, right? It's, like, this really desperate scene. And she grabs Thing. She pulls him close to her. And she goes, and she says something like, if you, if you, uh, if you, like, if you die, I'll kill you. This is like the most upset that she's been in the entire show. And she says, if you die, I'll kill you. She's like a, uh, a fucking Superboy line. No, that's all, I'll kill you to death. And, and it's like this dumb, silly, cringy, 
immature line, but like it could have been really good, right? It could have been that could have been a great I think that could have worked because it's so it's it's like the most vulnerable she's ever been in the show. And it's almost like for a moment you can get to see what's really going on underneath this like super shelled like insular walled up persona of of deadpan that she has and that like this sort of almost uh, childlike immature fear that she has that she's going to lose a member of her family she's going to suffer a substantial loss and it could be partially her fault uh, that she involved thing in this and and that causes his death and and her saying this very silly immature line with total sincerity and then like if he actually died there could have been like the opportunity for like a literal growing up moment where like she has to get a little more mature and maybe a little more i don't know appreciative of the people around her or something like that you could have gone in a lot of ways that would actually be beneficial for her character it wouldn't be nice it would put her through a lot of suffering but it fucking like at this point god damn how much how much do you have to go through how much bad shit has to happen as a result of you for you to change your actions a little bit and then thing just comes back to life and then he's just cool, and then she she sews him back up, and it's all good. And it's like, oh, okay. I uh, well, I, maybe we'll get some fun thing hijinks later. All right, you know, we could have had real consequences there for a second. Uh, did not happen. Did not happen. So uh, anyway, moving on then. All right, then. <laughs> and it just it's stuff like this. It's like, why didn't they? Like, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Why is this? Happen? I just have so many questions. And it feels like it just comes down to, like, I don't know. And it's so weird that I feel that people think that Wednesday is like the best part of the show or that Jenna Ortega's performance is the best part of the show because the character, she does a fine job after those first couple episodes with really cringy, try-hard trying way too hard to be cool dialogue it kind of it eases up on it and it gets a lot better but like she, I, okay sure she does a a fine job after that after that part after that's over with and she's not doing that stuff anymore she does a fine job of portraying a boring shallow character it it, it it's like it's like it's like the writers are banking on you enjoying her. It's like they're banking on her attitude being compelling rather than like the character. She's like poochie, <laughs> but she's like, she's like goth instead of radical. <laughs> like, like, she's the most important character. When that's literally what happens when she's not in the scene, all the other characters should be talking about, should be asking, where's Wednesday? Fucking Enid. <laughs> where's Wednesday? Uh, yeah, it's really just like boring, uninteresting, shallow character. She has nothing. If there is something going on under the surface, the show did not communicate that at all. There is nothing interesting about her. There is nothing likable. There is almost nothing to understand from the looks of it. She just... She just has an attitude and she makes snarky deadpan comments about how fucking cool she is. And I'm sorry. I don't enjoy that character. At all. <laughs> but hey. Is that it? Oh, there's probably more stuff. That dance sequence is really weird. Like that one that's gotten clipped a lot. It felt really out of character. It's like, okay, she's at the dance, which she didn't really want to be at in the first place, but she went because I kind of forget why. Um, and it's like, okay, I can see her being at the dance, but why does she start dancing? She seems to, like, hate she dancing or, or like, any anything, like, social. But she starts doing this wacky little dance. It's not the biggest deal, but I was like, this feels just, I don't know, this feels kind of out of left field. I feel like she would just stand there. 
What is with her, like, being a little social butterfly all of a sudden? <laughs> um, yeah. Anything else? God, it's a fairly dense show. Isn't there's, like, a lot that gets packed in? Uh, yeah, I mean... Hey, there's a season two coming. It got a, it got announced like the day before we watched the series. The day before Cat showed it to me, and uh, yeah, maybe hopefully, hopefully uh, the writing improves. Hopefully Wednesday has some actual motivations. Hopefully her character is a little less obnoxious. Hopefully Enid gets all of the nice things in life that she deserves. And, uh... Yeah. I guess that's all I have to say about Wednesday. It's alright. You can go watch it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> hey, I got one more thing I wanted to talk about. It's sort of a sort of a light topic I went back to Star Wars Galaxies and I know that when I made my dead MMOs video like a year ago I kind of trash talked it and I said that it felt bad and it's boring and I don't like sandbox games I still uh, moderately stand by that but having gone back to it for I believe the third or fourth time now because I just had an itching I just had an itch for it you know I just had an itch I did my usual thing where I put, like, I just uh, do nothing but play it for, like, 48 hours straight. <clears throat> and and then I just sort of drop it. And, uh, it's... My feelings on it have, have changed. My feelings on it have changed a little bit. Hey, hey, I wanted to mention, if we're on the topic, if you ever are curious um, about something that I, I am... I am that I, I think about, or if you disagree with me on something that I've ever said, um, feel free to just ask me about it, and I will 100% like on the podcast just talk about or on Twitter or whatever. Or however, I am very available. If you want to know how I felt about something or if my feelings have changed, um, and if I've gone back to it, uh, feel free to ask me because I feel like this is a good example where I my feelings have somewhat changed. So I went back to Star Wars Galaxies. I was playing on Restoration 3, which is the server that I was interested in because it is the co uh, combination of the basically two different versions of the game. There was the original kind of very sandbox version with like 32 different classes or something like that. Um, where you could like spec, you had a very wide skill tree that you could spec into. You could have a character who could play anything. Um, and then there was the new game enhancements part of the game that, that basically reworked the entire thing, uh, took out most of the sandbox elements and replaced them with a World of Warcraft style, you get nine classes to choose from, uh, and a bunch of theme park content, as it's called. A like, bunch of uh, uh, pre-made quests and stuff like that. Much less sandboxy. Uh, and, and Restoration 3 is basically the server that, that has, has uh, very impressive what they've done. Basically molded those two parts of the game together. It's essentially the, well, technically not the vanilla version of the game. It's the combat upgrade, which uh, fixed a lot of things about the combat from the vanilla version. Which a lot of players at the time, they didn't like it because it was a big reworking of how the game worked. Uh, but in retrospect, a lot of them actually ended, said that they it was better for the game long term. The problem was that the combat upgrade came like six months before the new game enhancements. So you get two back-to-back -back complete reworks of the game and the new game enhancements plays totally differently. <laughs> they reworked the combat like twice in a row. <laughs> so it's basically the combat upgrade era of the game that still has all the sandbox 32 class thing and then uh, all of the uh, pre-made sandbox content of the new game enhancements, but without the rigid kind of class structure and stuff like that, or class selection. And there are still, okay, I still have problems with the game, and this is not on the Restoration 3 people. What they've done has been, is very impressive, and I very much appreciate people who keep up servers like this. 
especially ones like this with heavy amounts of, of you know, groundwork done to uh, pull off a, a merging like that. It's more just on the, on the game itself. And you could consider this more of a critique, critique of the game more than this server. Uh, the game... So first of all, I do want to say, this might be on the, on the server team. The game does feel better. It does feel better to play in a lot of ways. Um, I think I kind of got the hang of how the combat works, generally. Um, whereas before it felt very stiff and weird, and I, I didn't know what was happening, and there wasn't a lot of... I didn't get a lot of good feedback from it, and for some reason I got into it the past week, and, and it just sort of clicked. And I, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but, but it did. Uh, so it does feel better. So my complaint from my video ha has... has I, I kind of go back on that a little bit. Uh, it still does not have great combat. It does not have very interesting combat. And this is on the game itself. Uh, most of Star Wars Galaxy's combat boils down to... You have your two strongest abilities. And you just kind of hit them because they're on a rotating cooldown. You just sort of hit them one after the other, back and forth, back and forth, uh, whenever they're, you know, off cooldown, because again, they're rotating. And then you sort of do that until the thing dies. And there really isn't a lot of depth to it, of, like, mechanically. And I understand that not every one is going to prioritize that but mind you i'm coming from actually specifically i wasn't even talking about other games i should talk specifically my big mmo experience was with final fantasy 14 and that is also a game that has um a very open class system where you can play a lot of different classes but one thing about 14 is that every class almost feels like like when you get to their end game rotation right uh which obviously changes every expansion because they get a bunch of new abilities every expansion. Uh, but but it, it at least, like, okay, let's say uh, the first level cap was, what, 60, I think? I forget. Let's just say 60. Um, let's say when you get to level 60... No, 50. 50 was the first level cap, I think. So you get to level 50. That feels like... A, all those abilities feel like a com complete rotation of abilities. And, like, you're using... Almost all of them in some sort of sequence of a combo. Every class, or job as they're called, has a unique mechanic. They have some kind of unique, at least one. Some of them have multiple. Like a unique bar that fills up, or a meter, or a resource. Uh, that are all very specific to the class. And, and the job, sorry. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it feels very much like... Um, Almost like you're playing a character as opposed to a, a class, if that makes sense. Like you're playing a, a a character who is designed to do this thing as opposed to abilities that feel very like isolated from each other. Like everything, all the all these abilities that these classes have in fourteen feel like they they just work and they weave uh, between each other really well, and like they all build to something. Um, so like playing, yeah, playing your class and like understanding your rotation and how you use certain abilities and which ones, okay, this one's for this sort of utility. I, I sort of like have this basic rotation and then depending on the situation, I might adjust it like this or that. Um, and it's very engaging. Like the, the, once you, it, it starts off very slow. Like they really ease you into the combat system. But once you get like a couple abilities, especially once you get to like uh, you know the higher levels and you have like a good amount of your rotation, it gets very engaging to play the classes in 14. This does not have that, and that is something I really like about 14 and something that I, I really don't care for in Galaxies. That it's, mind you, I'm only like level 21 in Galaxies, but I am I did just hit a uh, bounty hunter, which is sort of like a what would you even call it like a second tier class. Uh, the way that it works is like you have a couple different, you have several different trees, several different classes, and then um, each class has like four separate trees inside of it. And there's like basic classes and then like advanced classes and then hybrid classes, which require you to get um, at least like one full tree of something in uh, a different like basic class, two different basic classes, I should say. 
So like bounty to be a uh, so for instance, uh, if you're gonna be a, a pikeman, you can go into you basically start out as like the pikeman skill or whatever. I'm just gonna make shit up because I'm not I'm not the the a, a super expert on the game. So off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly everything. So actually, let me go to like marksman or something. So for marksman, there's like four main kinds of guns: rifles, pistols, carbines, and uh, oh no, there's only like three. And and then the the, the fourth uh, branch is uh, just I think combat prowess or something like combat experience. So by like using one of those guns, you'll gain that type of experience. It's like you know like a Skyrim or something like that. And then you'll also gain like combat experience. And then you can level up once you get enough points. Once you get enough, like basically you hit an experience threshold, you can go put a point at like a skill train, or you can put a point into the next level of that branch for that gun, that type of gun, let's say. So you can level that all the way up to like, if you get all four trees, you can become a master like marksman or something. And then beyond that, you can then further level into like, you can basically spec into one of those, you can be a carbineer or a rifleman or something like that. Or you can do, uh, so what I did was, was uh, you uh, need at least, I think uh, some, you need, you need a certain level of marksmanship Oh, you need, like, to hit max at, like, the combat level. Like, the combat, like, the, the general combat experience branch of the marksman tree. Um, not a specific type of gun. I, I chose to level up carbines. Um, and then you can, and then uh, you need, like, there's a different class of scouting. And you need a specific branch, I think, like, terrain exploration or something like that. From the scouting tree. So you got to level that up to like all four levels, and then you can go into you can become a novice bounty hunter, and then start leveling up the bounty bounty hunter tree, uh, which has its own four branches. And so I just hit like twenty one, which is like the around the minimum that you would need for that, give or take a few levels, because I had to put some other levels and some other other stuff to help me out. I can't say that I'm like a super expert on the game, and I can't say that I've I've got the end game of the of the combat down. But just from, like, looking ahead at what you get, it seems like pretty much more of the same. It's like, oh, a more powerful version of this ability I already have. And a different, more powerful version of this other ability I already have. <laughs> and it's like, okay, it looks like I'm basically just going to be using these, like, f three or four abilities, depending on if I'm doing single target or AoE clearing. And uh, just very basic... And it's a real slog until you get a decent gun. Like when you get when you have just the basic level one like type of weapon, you will just be standing. I was standing there and I was so it was getting really tiring to just spend like a minute on every individual enemy because you do so little damage. Once I got a decent gun, it got a lot better. Um, and that's really like the 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 progression of the game is just buying better equipment you don't really earn that much good equipment you earn some from like the quest lines from like the theme park content but a lot of it is just you can go buy stuff you can just go buy a better gun or better armor and that's uh kind of just the progression so the combat is not great it's serviceable it, it's it's passable. It's tolerable when you have a decent weapon and it's not taking you a minute to kill every individual enemy. Um, the how would I okay the the theme park content and this is a complaint I really still have from the original video is it you can feel the panic in how this game was developed. You can feel in the way that the theme park content is designed, how they were just frantically trying to make the game like World of Warcraft. And taking this world that does not feel designed for theme park content and just kind of shoving it into that style and that structure. And it just ends up feeling very hollow, or maybe not hollow, but like, it's bad. The questing in galaxies is bad. It's very 
like all of the the um stereotypes about mmo questing pretty much that's what this game has go kill eight of these things come back to me get your reward it's that it's that over and over and over again uh except you're progressing through a storyline sort of sort of like you know there's like a a thing you go from like a to b to c uh and it starts getting really bad when it's like kill six six of these things now drive for a minute to a different location and kill eight things now drive for a minute to another location and kill 12 things and it just keeps getting more and more and more and more and it just goes it's so time wasty and it's such a slog like it really is it's so ugh, ugh. like fuck i gotta ugh, gotta kill fucking 16 rats now again and like multiple parts like just multiple parts of these quest lines and it's just like this is all you're really doing there's like one quest that's sort of interesting where you're doing like a race and you actually do like it's not even a race it's basically just a a time trial where you're just going from like waypoint to waypoint that's like kind of the most interesting one that i've done so far but it really is just the majority is go here kill these this many enemies and or get this item hey this item is a drop from these enemies there's no set amount you have to kill just pray for the drop rate to be kind to you it's not great. It's not a great part of the game. Um, I, things that... So why did I enjoy it? Why did I go back and why, why have I left with a slightly more positive connotation? And the truth is that it just kind of has a bit of a smoother curve. Once you, ha once you sort of upgrade your weapons, once you, you're allowed to kind of get into it and, and go around and... I made a series of tweets about how bad the combat is, and I said something that I still do stand by, which is that if this game was not called Star Wars, no one would care about it. And yeah, I, I stand by that. Uh, but the fact that it is called Star Wars does add a little something to it, and I can't lie about that. I found uh, there's a location in the game, because I've basically been spending all my time on Tatooine, of the, uh, you can go find the Lars Homestead, which is the, the farm that Luke grew up on from A New Hope. And this takes place after A New Hope. It's like somewhere between Empire and Return of the Jedi. And I don't know what it was, but <laughs> I found the Lars homestead and I was just looking at it. You can't even go inside, but you can see the building and, you know, the HUD and you can see the little um, sort of like pit in the ground from the movie where the, uh, you know, like the yeah, there's a, this sort of like under below ground part of the house. It goes into this little out, uh, courtyard with, uh, it's in this pit and, and just something kind of like came over me and just this little bit of, a little bit of nostalgia, a little bit of that Star Wars magic kind of like, just sort of like, uh, sparked a little in my heart. And I was like, oh, oh, wow. Hmm. This feels kind of nice. I don't often feel nostalgic for stuff, but, but that was pretty nice. I like that. <laughs> it's kind of neat. It's a, It feels a little special to be able to go to a location like that. Um, the atmosphere of the game is wonderful. It's really good. Walking around Jabba's palace, it feels like Jabba's palace. Walking around Mos Eisley, it pretty much feels like Mos Eisley. Um, oh god, the wound system. Ah, I, hate, I fucking hate the wound system. Okay. So there's two long-term, like, penalty stats. It's called Battle Fatigue and one called Wounds. Battle Fatigue is just that the longer you're in combat that you go without resting, which is pretty much just, like, sitting down, uh, you will rack up Battle Fatigue, and that will make you regen your health slower. The other one is Wounds, and Wounds are... I, I'm fine with Battle Fatigue. It's not the worst thing in the world. Wounds suck ass, and they're a very archaic, outdated thing that I'm glad no game does anymore. 
wounds are um yeah i mean they feel like an rpg but there's and there's mechanics like this in rpgs where uh your character can take basically permanent damage in the form of wounds where literally your health cap will be lowered uh i say cap is lower basically your health can only fill up so much there'll be like a black bar at the end that is basically like you cannot get this health back until your wounds have been healed so it, it's a, like a, a subtraction from your health pool basically and the more that you're in combat the more that you get hurt the more times you get ko'd the more wounds you rack up and in order to and it's not the worst thing in the world but it's like okay i would like to be able to heal the max especially if i'm going up against enemies that are around or above my my level in order to heal wounds you would need ugh, there's a Apparently, it's so fucking vague on this in this game. Everything's so vague. <laughs> one thing that one way of healing your wounds is with a doctor. Now, doctors are not NPCs. Doctors are players. If you have the doctor skill, if you are a novice doctor, you can heal wounds. You have the ability to heal wounds. So you have to find another player in the world who can heal your wounds. Now, because this is a fucking dead video game from like 2000 it shut down in 2011 which is 10 years ago over over 10 years ago uh yeah shocker shocker not a lot of people hanging out you basically have to go to either a cantina and really it's just going to be the like there's a very select few locations in the game world where you can even find a doctor right like a player and just kind of hope that someone is there and they have set up their character to be an AFK heal healing bot, essentially. And that's literally. And then you sit down, and then they they give you buffs. And then sometimes it just doesn't seem to work. And uh, then sometimes it does, and your wounds get healed, and then you can go back. Oh, what a terrible, just fucking time wasting mechanic. I feel like there could have been such. There could have been such a better use for do the doctor class. I don't know, man. It's just such... And I was reading, like, people's opinions on this mechanic. And there's people who legitimately are like, oh, it makes the game more immersive. And I'm like, if it makes it more... It makes it more immersive, but it makes the game, like, way fucking worse. It's just a time waster. It's just a time waster. If you can't figure out a way to give doctors some kind of purpose in the game world without introducing a shitty unfun mechanic why then just don't like change the way that doctors work just rework doctors like it's not fun it's so annoying because you're just sitting there you're just you literally just sit there and afk and then hopefully you can fucking make a sandwich or so they come back eat your sandwich hope that your wounds have been fully healed Ugh, just a lot of like time wasty stuff that gets on my nerves. Yeah, so what do I like about this game? Fuck, I was trying to talk about that, and then I got sidetracked with things that annoyed me. Um, oh, it's uh that because number go up. I can't lie, I like it when number go up. I just I, I get some enjoyment out of it. Number go up, Tyke and Happy go up. And just I don't know, it feels good. It's just a very like kind of mindless, brainless sort of gameplay loop. Where I just kind of sit back and relax and just get sucked in for like seven hours. Um, and then I just spend the whole day playing this game. And then I do that for like two or three days, and then I never play it for like six months. And then I come back to it. And then do the same thing. Uh, yeah. That's honestly kind of it. If that sounds interesting to you, and you're interested in a game with... Hey, same thing I said from the video. In a game that has some Star Wars atmosphere. Be my guest. Um, that's kind of all I had to say. Oh, hey. Uh, quick quick story. Um, a bunch of people at Microsoft, uh, specifically ZeniMax, uh, union, uh, unionized. That's great. Cool. Specifically in QA testing. Uh, good for them. I just wanted to mention it. 
because it feels like it's on brand <laughs> for this show. Uh, yeah, this has been a really long episode. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to wrap it up here. So, uh, if you if you have been listening this far, <laughs> 2 hours and 45 minutes, uh, thank you so much for listening to me ramble. Uh, if you have a question, please leave it down in the comments below, and I will definitely get to it next time, but please f- uh, phrase it in the form of a question, because I'm not just going to read your thoughts out loud. Uh, I've been Tygen. And uh, I'll be, uh, n- uh, I'm going to start work on, uh, on the next video uh, the week that this goes up. I also want to just do, I'll, I'll do a little recap episode of like, it'll probably be a short mini episode to be like episode 81 or something to uh, review. Like, let's do our 2022 review of what happened. And uh, I might go through every video. I'll figure it out. Uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Bye.